All right, we'll get started. Welcome everyone and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, to the bicentennial celebration uh, to the Greek Revolution of 1821. This program will provide us an opportunity to recognize and honor those who fought uh, to liberate Greece from a 400 year occupation, review the history and current events, enjoy Greek school and Goya presentations, and also have an academic and realistic discussion about why this point in time in history is important to us today. Kalimera sas, ke ya tus simetako desnilada, kalispera, arhika, thaithala na sas efharistiso, olusas, ke to kathena, ya ti bar, ya που μας τιμήσετε σήμερα με την παρουσία σας. Προχθές συμπληρώσαμε τα 200 χρόνια από την έναρξη της Ελληνικής Επανάστασης. 200 χρόνια από την πρώτη προσπάθεια απαλλαγής από τον τουρκικό ζυγό. Τα 400 χρόνια που έζησαν οι προγόνοι μας μαζί με τους κατατητές ήταν δύσκολα, αλλά γεμάτα προετοιμασία για τη μεγάλη αυτή αρχή. Το χαρμόσιμο μήνυμα αυτό που συνδέθηκε με τον Ευαγγελισμό Μακάρι να είναι παράδειγμα για όλους μας για να μην ξαναζήσουμε από κοντά τη δική μας ιστορία. Το webinar αυτό έχει οργανωθεί για να εκφραστεί όσο καλύτερα μπορούμε το θέμα. Ελπίζω να το απολαύσετε. Σας ευχαριστούμε. Our program is filled with, I think, uh, it's pretty exciting. We have both presentations from Greek school in, uh, in Goya which you'll see shortly, and also five keynote speakers that are today with us live, which include professors Molly Green from Princeton, Thomas Gallant, UC San Diego, Stavro Constantino, Ohio State University, Nicolaos Zacharias from the University of the Peloponnese, and Rick Newton from Kent State University. Thereafter, the speakers will join us for a short panel discussion. So save your questions. Uh, you can use your chat function uh, as part of the Zoom to send your question. If you'd like to direct it to the speaker, do so. We'll keep track of those questions and we'll try to pose them uh, as soon as practical at the end of the program. At this time, we'll proceed with the national anthem and followed by a short uh, Greek school program uh, put together by um, the Greek school director, Tia Famikilis, and a few of her kids. Can hear. Hold on, sorry, sorry guys. I think we had a little problem with um, audio. Let me fix that. Oh, here, this shit's on. Sorry about that, everybody.
next we have the the Greek school poem. All right, very nicely done. And I would like to now turn our attention and introduce to you uh, Dr. Molly Green, uh, who is our first speaker this afternoon. Uh, professor Green is a full professor at the Department of History and the Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. She is a, a historian of the Ottoman Empire with a particular interest in the history of the Greek world under Ottoman rule. Uh, Professor Green has authored many books, book chapters, and articles on this subject matter. Dr. Green, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Tarukas, very much for uh, inviting me. It's my great um, pleasure to be able to speak to the um, um, to a, a, a Greek uh, audience here in the U.S. I don't often um, give talks to the general public, and um, it's a nice way to repay even a little bit um, uh, my debt to Greece, a country that I love, um, um, which I consider mu patrida. So uh, I am an historian of empire. Uh, this is a part of the world that was organized on an imperial basis um, from the time of the Romans around the birth of Christ um, until 1924 with the end of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so I think it's important to understand uh, what it means to be part of an empire, um, in this case, particularly what it means for uh, the Greeks. Let me share my screen. Let's hope this goes off without a hitch. We'll let you know. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to start in Yanina in 1336. Uh, Yanina at that time was the capital of the despotate of Ipirus, uh, one of several states that had come into being after the Latin conquest of Constantinople in 1204. Uh, and continued even after the Byzantines recovered the capital city in 1261. In that year, the despot John Orsini, uh, an Italian, died. Chronicles of the time hinted that his wife, the Byzantine aristocrat, Anna Peleologina, might have killed him. Her motive would have been John's overtures to the Byzantine emperor for some sort of closer relationship. Anna and the emperor were mortal enemies. Unfortunately, we have no images of Anna, um, but here is the church of Padigoriti, so that's still uh, existing in Arta, uh, which was founded by Anna and John's immediate uh, predecessors. Arta was, of course, one of the principal cities of the despotate. So John's death exposed the political division in Ipidos between those who favored independence uh, and those who wanted to come to a settlement with Constantinople. The Byzantine emperor moved fast and appointed his own relative as governor as soon as John died. The people of Yanina were violently opposed. Some of the priests went so far as to excommunicate anyone who had any dealings with the new governor. The people of Yanina were loyal to Anna, who had lavished privileges on their city. Just a few years prior, she and John had confirmed the metropolitan of the city in his possession of many villages, fields, and monastic 
monastic foundations, uh, and they gave the church more properties at this time, all of which exempt or were exempt from taxation. So Anna was the one to decide, should they go to war? The Chronicles tell us how Anna thanked the Ipiros for their confidence in her, but she came down on the side of diplomacy. Neither she nor her young son, Nikiforos, could take command, and it seemed that resistance would not be unanimous or united. Instead, she sent ambassadors to the emperor with a set of specific proposals and alternatives. They would accept the emperor's offer that Nikiforos and his son be married to the daughter of a close ally of the emperor. They promised to supply an army to fight for the emperor should he request it. They would ask in return that they be left to manage their own affairs. The ambassadors were duly sent, but the emperor proved to be far more inflexible than anyone had expected. He accepted the marriage, of course, but he said they must give up their autonomy, and if they refused, he would impose his rule by force. The ambassadors, knowing they could not prevail, submitted to the emperor's demands, and soon afterward, the emperor arrived in Iperus to receive the voluntary submission of the army, the leading citizens, and the leading um, um, uh, rulers of the despotate. The emperor distributed honors and pensions and rewards to those in authority, but he would not allow Anna to stay. When he departed, he took her with him and settled her on an estate in Thessaloniki, large enough to support her for the rest of her life. I'm telling you this story for two reasons. First, the Ottomans did not bring about the fall of the Byzantine Empire. It had already fallen in 1204. And despite the recovery of Constantinople in 1261, it could not be put back together. What we have after 1261 is several Byzantine successor states, each with their own interests and their own elites, who were not for a minute going to submit to the capital city. Second, I hope that this brief story of Yanina in the 14th century, about a hundred years before the fall of Constantinople, helps to illustrate why it is misleading to think in modern terms of one state occupying another state, let's say Turkey occupying Greece. Instead, what we have are an unending series of local communities who through the vicissitudes of war sought to protect their own fortunes. And they had to work very hard uh, to do so. The 14th and early 15th centuries were a particularly brutal time as extreme political instability meant that no sooner had one leader established his rule than another rose up to challenge him. The people of Yanina, for example, enjoyed only a few years of Byzantine rule before the Serbian King Stefan Dushan took the city away from them. In this early period, the Ottomans played this game the exact same way as everybody else as they moved across the Balkans, beginning just about a decade after Anna's story. They contracted marriage alliances with Byzantine pretenders to the throne and Byzantine elites, including John Orsini, did not hesitate to call in Turkish soldiers to help them in their battles with other groups, particularly the Albanians. Those Christian rulers who submitted to the Ottomans were given local autonomy but had to supply an army to the Sultan, just as Anna had offered to the Byzantine emperor. When the citizens of Thessaloniki submitted peacefully to the Ottomans in 1387, they were allowed to keep their churches and their possessions. But the second time around in 1430, they refused to submit. And when the Ottomans finally took the city, they pillaged it without mercy and enslaved the population. The monks of Manathos, by the way, decided not to wait for the Ottomans to arrive. They went and offered their submission to the Sultan and he in return confirmed, their, confirmed them in their privileges. Now, of course, there is a difference. Whenever a submittee, whether a city submitted to or resisted the Ottomans, the main church was always converted into a mosque. And of course, I don't wanna minimize the shock of the loss of Constantinople. But even after 1453, we shouldn't conclude from this that the story of the Ottoman Empire is one of steadily declining Christian fortunes versus a triumphant Islam. Instead, I would argue that Christians more or less shared the fate of or moved to the same rhythms of the larger Ottoman society of which they were a part. And I wanna make that argument because there is still a mistaken uh, but common misunderstanding, I think, uh, of the Ottoman centuries, uh, which is exemplified by a mosaic that one sees as one enters the patriarchate in Istanbul today. It shows Mehmed the Conqueror handing the patriarch, Ganadios, a scroll confirming him in all his privileges. This image, which was installed in the 19th century, encourages the idea that the Sultan handed over control of the Christians to the patriarch who led the Christians into kind of a, a state within a state where they kept their distance from Ottoman society as much as possible. 
This is not the case. The history of the Greek world cannot be understood without understanding the larger imperial context, the rhythms of Ottoman state and society that I mentioned above. This is the main point I wanna to make today and I'd like to give you several examples of what I mean, drawn from the 16th and 17th centuries and then from 1821. The period between 1453 and 1600 roughly was generally a time of peace and stability for the empire and Christians shared in that good fortune. Across the Balkans in both cities and villages, the population grew, taxes were relatively light and a number of monasteries were founded. The famed collection of monasteries at Meteora is a good example. The Byzantinist Donald Nichols writes, the 16th century was in many ways the era of their greatest glory. The monastery of Varlam was founded by the brothers Nectarios and Theophanes uh, from a Byzantine family who came um, to the Meteora from Yanina early in the 16th century. Uh, and another pair of brothers um, also from Yanina at the same time uh, founded the monastery uh, of Rusanu. By contrast, the 17th century was a difficult time across the empire and not surprisingly, churches and monasteries suffered. Here's an inscription from a small uh, monastery in what is today's Southern Albania. And I'll leave you there to um, read it yourself. <clears throat> Art historians have confirmed the drop off in Christian construction and artistic creation after the intense activity of the 16th century. When work was commissioned it took many years and often the small contributions of many ordinary people rather than the benefaction of a wealthy patron to finally complete for example the iconic program in a church. An inscription from a church in Epidos in 1612 different from this church tells us that 46 donors contributed to the painting of the narthex of the church. But it was not only monks and Christian villagers who were struggling in their modest projects. Again this theme of similar rhythms we see a scaling down of admittedly much more ambitious architectural projects, even amongst Muslim elites. Grand viziers, for example, no longer built grand mosques. And the two great mosque complex that were built in this period, the Blue Mosque and the Yanijami, showing you a picture of the Yanijami right, in the, right across the Galata Bridge in Istanbul. These were both highly controversial because times were difficult and there had been no victories in Christian lands. In fact, the Yanijami was abandoned in 1603, just a few years after construction began because of so much opposition. It fell into ruin and wouldn't be completed for another uh, 60 years during this difficult period of the 17th century. The troubles began in the final two decades of the 16th century when wars, inflation and luxury at the court drove the Sultan to search for ever more sources of revenue. One of the ways he did this was to increase taxation and the monasteries were hit hard. The difficulties of the monks, uh, as we saw on that previous slide, no doubt stem from this period. The Sultan also intensified the sale of offices since every time a new occupant assumed an office, he paid a sum to the Sultan. As a result, um, we see the rapid um, uh, circulation uh, of uh, patriarchs coming to the throne. You can see the difference between uh, the first four um, numbers uh, and then just between 1580 and 1600 um, 14 patriarchs um, held the throne but if you look next door it's the exact same story with grand viziers and for the and for, and for the same reasons <clears throat> my final example of similar rhythms uh, comes from the reason that we're here today uh, that is 1821. many years ago the historian Denis Giotis wrote the following the greek revolution broke out because the Ottomans mistakenly decided to humble the one man, Ali Pasha, known as the, uh, known as the Lion of Yanina, who could have prevented it, end quote. This interpretation, I think, still holds today, but now we know that there was more than one Ali Pasha and more than one mistake. What I mean by that is that is the following. There was unrest across the Balkans from the 1790s through the 1830s, from Greece to Serbia, from Bulgaria to Bosnia. This unrest came not from nationalism, but from pressure within Ottoman society due to a desperate state facing almost continuous warfare. Just to give you a sense of what the uh, empire was up against uh, in the years around the revolution. A succession of sultans squeezed the population for resources needed for military reform and ruthlessly disciplined anyone suspected of obstructionism.
<clears throat> Osman Pazvantalu, the governor of Vidin, uh, is a good example of an uprising that foreshadowed 1821. Um, and he was, by the way, a good friend of uh, Rigas uh, Ferreos. This is from Rigas's famous poem. Uh, and you see that he mentions um, Pazvantalu. Pazvantalu was violently opposed to Selim III's efforts to set up a new army. And in this, he had the support of the population under his rule both Muslim and Christian who are being asked to pay for it. A military expedition against the Pasha in 1797, Istanbul threw 100,000 soldiers against him, failed to defeat him. Just two years later, the Sultan forgave him and he continued to rule in Vidin uh, until his death in 1807. The Sultan had to cave in because of the war with Russia. Now the year 1812 doesn't stand out in our telling of the Greek revolution, but it is a vital date. In that year, the latest Ottoman Russian war ended and the Sultan began in earnest his attempt to eliminate local strongmen, men like Osman Pasvantalu had been, men with whom the Sultan had had to tolerate due to the war with Russia. And of course, one of these men would be Ali Pasha of Yanina. One author has written, what followed was to all intents and purposes, a civil war between the Ottoman central state and a myriad of provincial magnates of varying, varying calibers religions, ethnicities, and levels of popular support. This took place across the empire, not just in the Balkans, but in Anatolia as well. Ali Pasha's fall was particularly spectacular, but it was not the only one. The Greek leadership, both those who supported the Philikiateria and those who did not, were well aware of the civil war. In the winter of 1820-1821, it was Hershid Pasha who was given the task of taking on Ali Pasha, and everyone knew who he was. He became Grand Vizier in 1812, precisely when Sultan Mahmud began his campaign against the local strongmen once the war with Russia was over. He suppressed the Serbian revolt in 1813, and in 1819, he put down three sizable revolts in Baghdad, Diyarbakir, and Aleppo. Now, of course, we know that it was only the Greek revolt and only the Greek revolt in the Peloponnesos that succeeded in carving out a new state. Others can speak with much more authority than I as to why that succeeded. But this success gives me an opportunity to say something about everyday life in the empire, which Mr. Saruka said asked me to say something about. Now this might seem like an odd pivot, so let me explain. One of the reasons certainly that the Greek revolution succeeded was the idea of friends, the Philikiateria. As I'm sure you know, it was founded by Greek merchants in the Black Sea, uh, Black sea port, uh, port city of Odessa. The very fact that there were Greek merchants in Odessa, and I could point to many other places on the map as well, points to the incredible complexity of the Greek world under the Ottomans, a complexity that no other group had, at least at this time. I've spent most of this talk emphasizing the ways in which Christians more or less shared the fate of the larger Ottoman society around them. In some ways, however, the Greeks of the empire were very distinct, not just vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim community, but even vis-a-vis -vis other Christians. I would say then that it is not possible therefore to speak of everyday life for the Greeks of the Ottoman Empire because the experience of people we call Greeks was so very diverse. I'll just leave that up there. I won't take the time to read it, but this is a good description um, um, from, from an old book, but a, still a classic by Stavrianos. <clears throat> I would go further than this social and political description uh, and finish by telling this audience uh, what I always tell my students, which is that prior to the 19th century, Greek was a civilization much more than a race or an ethnicity. We can still see this uh, sentiment expressed in the, um, in the inscription that is on the um, um, front of the Gennadius Library in Athens. Right? Greeks are, are, Greeks are called those who take part in our education. In other words, Greek civilization was something that uh, people could and did join. Uh, it was much bigger than what is uh, the uh, Greek state today. Uh, and this means that the Greek world was vast, both geographically uh, and in terms of the people who potentially could be uh, included in it. Although we are here today to celebrate and rightly so the brave achievements of the men and women of 1821, revolutionaries who sought to bring an end to Ottoman rule I myself have always been fascinated by the wide sweep of the Greek world prior to 1821. 
And I hope that I've been able to convey to you today at least something uh, of the world that produced the revolutionaries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. That was terrific. Thank you very much. There'll probably be some questions for you here towards the end of the program. Uh, but the, the next up is going to be a video um, by two Goyans, a uh, video presentation of the various uh, heroes and heroines of the Greek Revolution. Dr. Green mentioned a few, and that includes pre and post uh, revolutionary figures and by region. Keep in mind, due to time constraints, um, this is an overview and a summary and not intended to be all inclusive by any means. And I'm sure there's many, many other heroes and heroines to be mentioned, but um, the children weren't able to go into that great of detail. Nonetheless, here is Pano and Katerina uh, Tsarukas that I'll play for you here shortly. Revolutionary figures who contributed efforts leading up to the revolution, which include but are not limited to Rigas Ferreos, born in Thessalia in 1757, who lived in Vienna, Austria, and was well educated and an avid writer and publisher in support of Greek independence. Among his famous works is the Thurio Turiga, a patriotic battle hymn, which includes the well known verse, Kalitera mia soras, eleftheri zoi, para saranda chronias, glavraki filaki. Better to have an hour of freedom than 40 years of slavery. Adamandios Corais was born in 1764 in Smyrna and lived in Paris. He was a prolific writer of modern Greek literature and a major figure during this period of Greek enlightenment. He also paved the way for the simplification and purification of the Greek language. His writings and beliefs influenced the creation of the Greek constitution Tosin Dagma. The Filipina Teria was a secret fraternal society established in 1814 in Odessa, Russia, by three founders and merchants, Emmanuel Xantos, Nikolaos Kupas, and Athanasius Tsakalo. The Filipina Teria required its members to take a sacred and sworn oath of secrecy in support of Greece's independence. It became the most effective conduit for information, logistics, communication, organization, and financing for the preparation and execution of the War of Independence. By 1812, it had thousands of members, which included wealthy businessmen, scholars, generals, government officials, prominent revolutionaries, including many of the heroes of the revolution. Alexandros Ypsilantis was born in 1792 in Constantinople. He was a Greek nationalist and senior officer in the Imperial Russian Cavalry in the Napoleonic Wars. Prior to the revolution, he led one of the first campaigns in the Balkans against the Ottomans in Moldavia in February 1821. Although he was defeated at this battle, his efforts further inspired the March 25th, 1821 declaration of war. His continued efforts and leadership during the revolution eventually led to the autonomy of the new Greek state. We will now recognize some of the prominent revolutionary leaders from the various regions of Greece, starting with the rebellion in Peloponnesos, which include Palom Patros Germanos, the Metropolitan of Patras, raised the Greek flag at the in the cross at the monastery of Aya Labra near Patra with many of the leading generals taking an oath of liberty or death and proclaimed the official declaration of war for independence on the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th. Gregorios Dikeos Flesas was born in 1788 in Turia, Greece, outside of Kalamata. He was a priest ordained as an Archimandriti and was commonly known as Papa Flesas, who was a very influential leader the revolution and had been appointed Minister of the Interior. He died at the Battle of Maniaki on May 25, 1825. Theodoros Kolokotronis was born in 1770 in Arcadia. He was a Greek general and considered to be a preeminent leader of the Greek Revolution. Kolokotronis had served in the Russian Navy during the Russo-Turkish Wars, served in both the French and British Army, where he has achieved the rank of major. Kolokotronis is often referred to by Greek Americans as the George Washington of the Greek Revolution. 
Kolokotronis' nephew, Nikitas Tamatelopoulos, a.k.a. Nikitaras, born in Arcadia in 1782. He, also, he was also a very popular revolutionary, notorious for his fighting prowess. His nickname was Nikitaras or Turkophagos, the turkey eater. Dimitrios Ypsilandis was born in 1793, served as a high-ranking officer in the Imperial Russian Army and brother of Alexandros Ypsilandi. He played a significant role, not only liberating the Peloponnese, but also maintaining its independence after several initiatives by the Ottomans to recapture the territory. By 1828, he was appointed commander of Eastern Greece. He died in 1832. We will now talk about the leaders and heroes of Central Greece, commonly referred to as Sterea Lata or Rumeni. Athanasius Masavetas of Yakos was born in 1788 and educated at a local monastery. At 17 years of age, he was ordained as a deacon, hence his Elias name Athanasius of Yakos, the deacon. He later joined the resistance and fought along at other national heroes, such as Dimitrios Panurgas, Georgios Karaiskakis, Odysseus Andruchos, and Yanis Makriyanis to liberate the central region in Greece. He was well known for the last stand at the Battle of Alamana near Thermopylae, where he chose to stay behind and fight with 48 men and was wounded and captured. Before he was executed by impalement, he was offered a choice to live if he renounced Christianity and converted to Islam. He responded, I was born a Greek and I will die a Greek. We also recognize the heroines and heroes of the Aegean Islands, which include Lascarina Bubulina, who was born in Constantinople in 1771 and married to a wealthy shipowner and lived on the island of Spetas. She joined the Filipiateria and built a small fleet of battleships, including one of the largest warships of all time, Agamemnon. She took part in and fought at a number of very important naval battles and blockades at Nafion, Monambrasia, and Pilos. Posthumously, she was granted the honorary title of Rear Admiral of the Hellenic Navy. Antoma Brugianus was born in Trieste, Italy in 1796. She was well educated and influenced by the Age of Enlightenment. She studied ancient Greek philosophy and history at the University, university of Trieste and spoke French, Greek, Italian, and Turkish fluently. She was also a member of the Filikieteria, purchased many ships for the Navy, and financed hundreds of soldiers and sailors to join in key battles in the, Pel in the Peloponnese, Mesolongi, Northern Greece, and in the Kikades. She eventually spent the entire family fortune on the war. The Greek government granted her the honorary title of Lieutenant General. Several revolutionaries from the island of Tsara include Constantinos Canaris, Andreas Meoulis, and Dimitrios Panamikolis. Canaris was a well-known bulatieri, an explosive specialist, and for his naval warfare. He served as an admiral in the Greek Navy, then held a number of official posts in government, including prime minister. Meoulis was chosen to lead the Greek Navy as admiral and naval chief during the revolution. Panamikolis and Canaris were both very adept and well-known for their expertise in the use of explosives, fire ships which were used to destroy larger Ottoman ships. The heroes of Northern Greece and regions of Epiros, Thessalia and Macedonia include Anastasios Karatasos, Zafiraki Theodosiu, Agelis Gatsos, Marcos Bozaris, and Emmanuel Papas. All were members of the Filikieteria. Each of these heroes went on to become instrumental in the revolution, which weakened the Ottoman forces in the north and help the Greeks in, the, in South and Central Greece officially secure their freedom from Ottoman rule, which eventually led to Greece being recognized in the international community as a country and independent state. Revolution in Crete. Crete also joined in on the uprising in 1821, which was the first of many revolts in Crete during the 1800s. The revolt of 1866 is well known for the Holocaust of Arcadi, which occurred on November 8, 1866 and resulted in a death of nearly 300 rebel fighters and over 700 women and children who had taken refuge at the Arkadi Monastery. Although the Ottomans celebrated the victory, the events at Arkadi caused enormous shock in the international community. Ultimately, in 1897, Crete had secured its autonomy with the efforts of many Cretan and Greek leaders to include Eleftherios Venizelos, 
who served as Prime Minister of Greece, Crete was unified with mainland Greece in 1913. Throughout the war, Cyprus supported the 1821 revolution with supplies and with over 1,000 Cypriots who fought in mainland Greece. Archbishop Kiprianos of Cyprus was an unwavering supporter of the Greek Revolution and had also become a member of the Philippi Eteria in 1818. Tragically, however, the Pasa of Cyprus intercepted messages revealing the support that the Cypriots were providing to the Greeks and ordered the hanging and or beheading of over 470 clergy prominent Cypriots and Archbishop Kiprianos on July 9, 1821 and the imprisonment of many local leaders. It is estimated that over 2,000 Cypriots were executed for their participation in the revolution. In 1878, the Ottoman occupation ended, but it was not until 1960 that Cyprus became an independent republic. Patrons of New Greece include Alexandros Mavroportatos, who was a wealthy and well-educated politician and a member of the Filipiateria played a significant role in establishing a provisional government and administration in Greece in 1822 and was elected its president. He also served as the commander of the armies of central Greece and later held several official positions under President Ioannis Kapodistrias and eventually under King Otto, where he served as finance minister and then premier of Greece in 1833 and 1841. Count Ioannis Kapodistrias was born in Corfu, Greece, which at the time was under Venetian rule. He studied medicine, philosophy, and law at the University of Padua, Italy. He returned to Corfu to practice medicine, but eventually entered politics and became the chief minister of state for the Ionian Islands. He then served in the Russian government as ambassador to Switzerland and then foreign minister of Russia. After a long distinguished career in European politics and diplomacy, he was elected as the first head of state of independent Greece. He is considered the founder of modern Greek state and the architect of Greek independence. Tragically, he was assassinated on October 9, 1831 on the steps of St. Spiridon in Maklion, Greece. His death plunged the country into chaos, which eventually led to the installation of King Otto of Germany to rule the Kingdom of Greece. Last but not least, it is important <coughs> to recognize a few of the prominent Philippines during the Revolutionary War, which include Lord Byron, Charles Carlos Favier, and Sir Richard Church. Very good, thank you. Next we have Dr. Thomas Gallant, who holds the Nicholas Family Endowed Chair of the Modern Greek History and Distinguished Professor of History and Archaeology in the History Department the Center for Hellenic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. He received his PhD from Cambridge University in classical archaeology and has been a professor at universities in the US and Canada. He is the author of 12 books and over 50 articles. He has served as director for the Center of Hellenic Studies and served on the Modern Greek Studies Association Executive Board on multiple occasions to include being its president from 2003 to 2005. He was the social science editor of the Journal of Modern Greek Studies from 2015 through 2019, chaired the 2019 Symposium Program Committee, and currently is editor-in-chief of the 10-volume Edinburgh History of the Greeks and director of the collaborative project Catch-Up, California, Kios and Andros Social History and Archaeology Project. Dr. Gallant, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tony. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, there you go. Yes, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to join in the celebration of Excellent. 200 years. Excellent. We couldn't hear you. I know. So glad that you could join us. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hello. I can hear you, Tom. Yes. Okay. Great. So, as we gather this week to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Greek independence. And it's done, as we look back and 
have reenactments of the famous battles. And as we celebrate them, like the first battle of the Acropolis, which is the scene you see behind me, or the battle of the Alamana Bridge, which saved the revolution in 1822, or the famous naval battles. And here we see Condor Condoriotti sinking the Ottoman flagship. Well, while we celebrate these events and the heroes of the war, I would ask us to think also as well about the regular people the peasants, the artisans, the sharecroppers, the workers who suffered through 10 years of war. 10 years where the home front and the battlefront were won. And so we must recognize not just the heroic battles, but the great sacrifices of everyday people to achieve independence. But I'm going to begin. Come on now. I'm going to begin by asking this question. Uh, why should we commemorate the revolution or why should anyone who is not Greek care about it? Well, obviously it is the national holiday because it is Independence Day. And like Independence Day here in the US, it is you know, a grand celebration. Here's a scene from uh, Parade on, on, on Thursday. So indeed, we commemorate it because indeed it is such a momentous event. What I wanna argue is that the Greek Revolution had significance that far transcended the bounds of the Peloponnesus, the Aegean. And in fact, the Greek Revolution has to be understood, I would argue, in a global context. First, the Greek Revolution was the second successful revolution against a European empire, producing a secessionist state, the US being the other. It was also Europe's first nation state after France. And for these periods during the 19th century, it was actually had a more of a liberal dem democracy than most states in Europe. So Greece then, the Greek revolution actually started a process that created a nation state at a time when nation state building was in its infancy. The Greek revolution also impacted and was impacted by revolutions that were going on elsewhere. In other words, the Greek revolution has to be contextualized in this what we call the age of revolutions. Between 1800 and 1848, um, all of Europe will be wracked repeatedly by revolutions. Some of them succeed. Most of them, however, failed. Nonetheless, Greek revolution was part of them. So for example, the Decemberist revolt of Russian military officers in 1826 would seem to be very much a Russian event. And what does Greece have to do with it? Well, many of the officers in the Russian army who rose up were in fact Greek Russians who had come down and fought in the Revolutionary War in the first part and then went back to Russia to join their colleagues there. Many of the ideas, the tracks, the books, articles that had gener was generated in the Greek Revolution made their way elsewhere and impacted. There is a definite strong connection between the Greek Revolution and Latin American revolutions, both in terms of the ideas, the symbols that got people to rise up, risk everything to rise up in the hope of a better future. So we see then that the Greek Revolution was part of this global age of revolution, and it was a very, very significant player. As I mentioned, most liberal revolutions in the age of revolution failed. Within Europe, the two that succeeded were Belgium and Greece. And Greece was far more prominent because of the way it attracted global attention. So we commemorate it then because it is this, what we might want to say, transnational and global event. Now, what I want to argue to talk to you today specifically about is this. The revolution that began in 1821 did not end until 1882. What I want to argue today is that we have to look at the revolution in three acts. Why do I argue this? Well, we all know that 1832 is when the Greek state is officially recognized as an independent country and joins the, the, uh, the nations of the world. But 
I argue this because the political ideas that propelled much of the revolutionary leadership and many of its followers were drawn from European enlightenment and the American experience. These men and women prized liberalism, equality before the law and democracy. But in 1832, the state that came out of the revolution had none of those. My claim then is that the revolution's goal of creating a modern liberal democratic state with power and sovereignty vested in the people was only achieved in 1882 and that it was a result of a drama that took place in three acts. We'll look at act one, the democratic republics. While the war was raging, the revolutionary leadership obviously formed government. In 1882, they passed the first a constitution, the Congress of Epidavros, and here you see it, it, the monument at Epidavros to it. This was followed by two others culminating in the third Republican constitution. So when they had the opportunity to create their own states, Greeks created a liberal democratic state. Now, I must point out that though it was a democratic state, because of the wartime conditions, there weren't actually elections. But let's look at the state that was created. The Greek constitutions were based on uh, a number of them, but, but in particular, the American one was very influential. So the structure of the revolutionary government should look very familiar. There was an elected Senate, though, as I said, because of the war kind conditions, elections were haphazard and it was really only the wealthy who actually participated. So you had an elected Senate. The Senate elected its own leadership, but it was presided over by the vice president. And this is, this is pretty obvious. The executive consisted of a president, vice president, and initially three cabinets, foreign affairs, justice, and war. Now the constitutions also had to define who was a Greek. And this is where we have to think very carefully about what, how we understand what was Greek before the revolution and afterwards. Because notice this, this is article section, section B, paragraph B from the constitution. And it identifies who is actually a Greek. Now this is the legal definition. All the indigenous habitants of the territory who believe in Christ are Greeks. So it essentially means that everyone who was resident within the borders of what was being claimed as the revolutionary state was a Greek, whether they be Serb, Albanian, or anything else. If they were resident there, they legally became a Greek. So we have to be careful about our terminology. And as you can see, as I want to emphasize here, that these constitutions vested sovereignty in the people. Based on this second constitution, uh, the Republic was governed by President Ioannis Kapodistrias, whom we just talked about. Kapodistrias' reign was unfortunately interrupted by his assassination, as we just heard about in that lovely little video with the kids. And so with, with, but here's the significance of the assassination. With his assassination, the great powers determined, how's this for irony, that the Greeks were not ready for democracy. They were not ready for a public, even or constitutional monarchy because they weren't ready for self-governance and thus no constitution. So act two then is a democratic interlude. The state that comes out of the revolution was an absolute monarchy. Otto, you see the first king, young Otho, 17 year old Bavarian, will rule Greece as an absolute monarch. He is entitled King of Greece by the grace of God. And indeed, the period was referred to at the time as the Bavarokratia, and it was meant in a very negative way because the Greeks who had fought and sacrificed so much to achieve independence actually had minimal participation in their own governance, which was dominated by Bavarians. And even though Greeks had positions in government, they were lower ones. The decision-making, in other words, was all done at the top, and it was done in an absolute monarchy in which the people did not participate. That will change in the 1840s. In September 1843, 
There is, depending on which historian you read, either a coup d'etat or a revolution, part two. What happens is the royal guard of the city of Athens revolts and is joined by the, by, by the masses of the city. They surround the palace in the middle of the night and demand, and here you see the scene, here is Atha hanging out the window. Here is Colonel Dimitri Kaligas, who is leading the insurrection. And Otto had a choice. You either leave or you grant us a constitution. He chose the latter. And here you see the frontispiece from the constitution of 1844. The constitution of 84 also recognized Otto as the king of a territory of Elas, and it enshrined that it was a, officially a Greek an orthodox nation state. It was technically a democracy. Anyone, 25, all males, 25 years and older who owned land or had an income from a trade was eligible. There was an elected parliament and an appointed Senate. And here is how the powers were delegated. Otho got to appoint ministers and senators, whomever he want, when any he wanted. He had an absolute veto over any legislation. He could dissolve parliament sine causa, which means without cause. He could wake up one day and simply say, I want a new prime minister, because he could pick whomever he wanted to be prime minister, dismiss them. And he controlled the purse strings. What did the people get? Well, they got democracy, a legislature that would legislate, a ministerial government, and Otto had to agree that his heir would be orthodox. But this system, however, did not produce true democracy. So much power resided in the monarchy that Otto continued to frustrate the governments. And indeed, what we can call this is perhaps impaired democracy. But that would also change as we enter our third act, 1864. Otto's unpopularity continued to increase through the 1850s, particularly during the Crimean War, when he disastrously tried to bring Greece in on the side of Russia and against France and Britain. And you can guess the response. French and British navies bombarded the city, occupied Athens, and Otto was humiliated. His humiliation culminated in his overthrow. In October 1863, Otto and his wife, Queen Amalia, went on the royal lot, yacht for a tour around the Peloponnesus. When they tried to return home, they found the Piraeus Harbor blocked to them. While they were away, there had been a mutiny in the army and the navy. Otto would not be allowed back in. In fact, he couldn't even go, the family, royal family couldn't even go ashore to pack their belongings. So now, was the moment when Greece could truly, truly realize the vision of 1821. There was a new constitution, the constitution of 1826, which created what was called a crowned democracy. And you'll see why in a minute. So the constitution then of 18, 1864 was far more democratic. Here is the king that replaced it auto from a new dynasty. This is King George I from Denmark. He is not, however, king of Greece. He is king of the Hellenes. He is the king of the people. And it makes absolutely clear that sovereignty is vested in the people. There were to be a single house of parliament. He had no veto power. He could only control the palace finances, but he could appoint ministers whomever he wanted, regardless of which party or faction, he could pick anyone and say, you're the prime minister. And he could also dismiss. He still had the power to dismiss the parliament without cause. And he also committed to his heir. Here you see the, uh, a drawing from the time and here are three, the three leaders of the 1864 revolution. Well, the new constitution, while more democratic, proved to be totally unworkable. Um, here's the political scene in the decade from 1865 to 1875. 
In 10 years, there were seven general elections, 18 different governments. The longest lived one was three months. The shortest lived one was two days. And so, as you can see from that contemporary cartoon, Greece was in stalemate, gridlock. I won't make any mention about contemporary America, but certainly Greece at this moment was in absolute gridlock and chaos. Well, in 1876, the constitution was changed so that the king had to appoint the leader of the party, no, the leader who could command 50% plus one votes in the parliament. And what we see is a democratic transformation, radical one. It begins with the election of 1882. From 1882 until the until, well into the 20th century, for the first time ever, Greece will have a two-party political system and political stability. Two parties will form out of this mass of, of MPs, and there will be the two major parties. One will be led by Greece's greatest politician of the 19th century, Haileos Trigoupis. Bit of an aside, I once had a student write an essay about him, and throughout they referred to him as Hilarious Trigoupis. Um, he was anything but a funny guy, but he was the leader of liberal, the liberal movement, and he single-handedly did more to modernize Greek society, politics, economy than anyone in the, else in the 19th century. His party was the modernist party. Opposing them was the conservative nationalist party, led by Theodoros Delianis. With the stable two-party system, in which the monarchy played a much more ceremonial role and governance was left to the Greek people, what we see is a period of florescence. Between 1882 and 1897, Greece will be one, have one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It'll certainly become a regional power and it would for the first time be a modern liberal democratic state. And that is what we rose up about in 1821, but it was a dream not achieved until 1882. Thank you. That was terrific, Dr. Gallen. Thank you so, so much. Next, I would like to introduce to you, and many know uh, this individual because he's a member of our community, Dr. Uh, Stavros Konstantinou, born on the island of Cyprus and grew up in rural Paphos during the turbulent 1950s. He attend, after high school, he attended the Pedagogical Academy, the Cyprus Teacher Training College, and Cyprus College, where he aimed, earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography. Following graduation, he did his military service, and then from 1974 to 1976, worked as an elementary school teacher. Thereafter, he came to the United States in 1976 on a Fulbright travel grant, earning a Master of Science degree in Geography and Associate Science degree in Cartography, from the Western Kentucky University. Dr. Constantino pursued his doctoral studies at Kent State University from when he graduated in 1982. He taught briefly at Youngstown State University, but since 1984 has been teaching at the Ohio State University Mansfield campus and currently holds the position of Associate Professor of Geography. Ethnicity and migration are his main areas of interest in research. His main emphasis is on the quantitative analysis of these phenomena with case studies from Greek and Cypriot emigration. Dr. Constantino has published a number of leading articles uh, in geography and sociology journals, and he is pursuing additional research on two lines of inquiry, the changing spatial aspects of Greek American populations and the historical mm -hmm. geography of Cyprus. Dr. Constantino, thank you for joining us today. Is Dr. Constantino with us? Yes, he is here. He's trying to. Oh, here we go. We see, we see you. Okay. And, well. and just to make a note that the, the, the revised topic here is to discuss uh, geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean. So thank you, Dr. Constantino. Thank you, Antoni, for inviting me to participate in this uh, forum with these other colleagues from all over the country, from Greece. It uh, gave me a 
chance to reflect on this uh, topic and uh, bring in uh, my own uh, personal experience, if you wish, and uh, try to focus on the present uh, situation uh, that uh, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey are involved in. So I titled uh, my presentation, The Geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean with this uh, triangle, <clears throat> although there is other regional uh, dimensions uh, to it, and uh, by extension, actually the US, of course, and uh, Russia, the bigger powers. Let me start by saying, uh, as Antoni said, I was born and raised in Cyprus. I grew up in uh, a small uh, village uh, in Western Cyprus, in uh, Paphos. I don't know if any of you have traveled to Cyprus and know the place. I went to school uh, in the height of the anti-colonial campaign uh, in 1955-59. Uh, my village is located on these hills that uh, have a commanding uh, view of the main road that leads to the uh, interior of uh, the district of Paphos. So I have a lot of vivid experiences of the British uh, troops, uh, you know, behavior in those years, plus one of the better known uh, heroes of Cyprus, that the last one actually that the British colonial administration hung in uh, La Cozia was the uh, name of Aura Palicaridis. He was from my village and actually a neighbor, although I never got to meet him. After elementary school, I went to high school, and that's when the Greek uh, Cypriot, Turkish uh, Cypriot uh, conflict uh, started. Uh, 1963 to 69, I was in high school. And uh, later on, I joined the military after I got out of the military, actually, we had the Turkish invasion in 74. I worked as a teacher, as Antonio mentioned, and then I came to the US in Fulbright Grand, and I've been here since. So let's uh, put this thing in a little uh, perspective. I don't know if how many of you have been to Mesolonghi. This is a statue in Mesolonghi that uh, shows actually, and in Gisimea it says at the top, Patris Kipros. And uh, at the right of this uh, statue is this uh, plug right here, which you see right here. <clears throat> we all uh, know when hear about Mesolonghi, we heard before about all of these thousands of Cypriots that uh, you know, participated in this uh, Greek war of independence, the Greek revolution. And uh, this plug lists the Cypriot agonistes over here. The first one listed, actually, it was one of my ancestors. His name was Christodoulos Kokinoftas. And under it, it says Abodinsada Papu. At the bottom is another neighboring village, Yannis Pasaportis. And you see the other names there as well. So when I was growing up, in the, I was born in the village. The family law was talking about this individual. I don't even know anything about uh, I mean, written or pictures or anything like that even exist until later on I went to high school to find books where there was a reference to this event. And of course, this flag in Mesolonghi commemorating the participation of the Cypriots in the famous events in the Greek uh, Revolution. Okay, we will say live show so you see the whole thing. Uh, so uh, that is the one personal, say, connection with this uh, Greek uh, revolution. The second one is something that uh, came up uh, more recently. Actually, I have been uh, taking uh, students uh, to Cyprus as part of the study abroad program from Ohio State. And uh, while taking them in uh, Paphos and uh, showing them around and all of that kind of stuff, uh, I came up with some information that led me to this individual right here. This is a book and, uh, about uh, a monk named Meledios. Actually, his worldly name before he became a monk was uh, Stavros, like me, from my village. And uh, as, uh, you know, Panos and, uh, um, and Katerina mentioned at the beginning, over 400 Cypriots were hung or beheaded by the Turks, 
by the two Mehmed, the governor of Cyprus. Uh, oops. Hold on one second here. Uh, in, uh, on July 9th, 1821, one of those 486 individuals actually was this monk from my village to give you an idea how far, how deep this uh, search of the governor of Cyprus reached to exterminate uh, every uh, leader of the Cypriot uh, Greeks, the Greek Orthodox uh, in Cyprus, in anticipation of the revolution spreading to Cyprus. So I looked into this and I found out about this information. The last uh, owner of this uh, family member that uh, had this uh, cross uh, donated actually to the uh, Byzantine Museum in Paphos, right there at the Bishopric. If you ever visit uh, Paphos, you can go and see this uh, cross in there. So I have this, again, personal connections with, you know, this, uh, the Greek War of Independence. So let's uh, move on now to uh, the, my presentation as a geographer. And uh, this is what I am going to talk about. I have a lot of information. However, I'm going to try to summarize it as much as possible. Geographers are interested in location. And I came up with this, uh, reflecting on this uh, role uh, of Greece, location of Greece as a prisoner of its geography. And uh, at the crossroads of three continents, I will say a few more things in a minute. The other uh, factor that is uh, constant and uh, limited is the physical environment and uh, the expansive uh, sea coastline facing a larger and aggressive neighbor. And of course, what are the politics? out of this location. And the issues that we have today is, of course, with Turkey, the Eastern neighbor, like you mentioned, uh, uh, and uh, Byzantium and all of these other times throughout the Greek history. I would say a few things about the migration, since it's a major issue in present day Greece. And the last item that I will cover is hydrocarbons especially in relation to Cyprus, where I come from. Okay, so here is a location uh, comparison uh, map that shows Greece in relation to the US. I don't know if you all realize the extent of Greece and, you know, north-south and, of course, uh, west-east. It's a big place, a huge place, actually, in terms of uh, the climate, latitudinally speaking. Uh, longitudinally, and as I mentioned before, uh, controlling this space and uh, exercising sovereignty over it. Here is a map of the EU, and as we can see from this, uh, Greece and Cyprus further east is uh, are at the crossroads of Europe, as I said, Asia and Africa, the place where East east meets west. In the context of Europe, the geographers talk about the core and periphery, and certainly Greece and Cyprus are on the periphery of Europe, core being, you know, the northwestern Europe, uh, Germany, France, those areas, the uh, United Kingdom, France. Uh, it is part of what in regional terms we call the Mediterranean Europe. It is the southernmost of the countries of the Balkan Peninsula. And uh, all of these, of course, uh, in the context again of the bigger interest in terms of power in these areas. On this uh, map, I we see the physical geography of Greece and by just glancing at it, one of the things that starts out immediately, and it has been a constant problem, is the lack of uh, fertile land. During the Greek uh, rebellion against the Turks, we have, uh, you know, and we heard before about the Ioannina and the despotate there and all of these other regions of Greece, 
geography, certainly throughout the millennia, you know, worked against uh, the country of Greece, or in ancient times with the city states and all of that kind of stuff, the fragmentation of the land, the lack of these extensive plains, the high mountains, hilly terrain, steep slopes, thin soils made it extremely difficult and it continues so to this day. I don't know how to. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, the deep, difficult uh, terrain, these uh, mountains, and uh, more importantly, also we have down here the largest city of the country, the most important place throughout the years. And if we look at this, there is hardly any land in the Arctic region, say, to support Athens. And of course, from ancient times, they turned to the sea, except you turn to the sea, you know, you have these smaller islands, and like across, uh, we have today the uh, large country of Turkey in ancient times, at least uh, and up until uh, you know, the early 1920s with the Treaty of Lausanne, the Greek uh, Turkish uh, War, 1922. You know, there were Greek colonies, Myrna, more specifically in the Western uh, Asia Minor. Now, all of that is gone. And uh, turning to the sea was, of course, an important uh, part of, the, you know, the rebellion against the Turks. And in addition to that, of course, we have the diaspora that was a part of uh, the uh, Greek uh, War of Independence, and even to this day. On this uh, map, we see the territorial expansion of Greece. There is a map that I did back in uh, 1985, actually, when I did a study on uh, Greek immigration. And we see how the incipient, say, Greek state expanded to come to what it is today with the loss of this area in Western Asia Minor. When I was preparing to talk about this uh, and thinking about this, what are the main issues? I looked up at the uh, internet, uh, the website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece, and these are the issues that they list as the most important foreign policy issue. So very briefly, I'll uh, go through the top uh, two uh, since they are the most important. And uh, let's look at the first one. Up until now, there was a lot of talk about the territorial seas, territorial waters. I have found these uh, two maps from the uh, Greek uh, military, and Linikos Stratos. Uh, and you see the, all of these hundreds and thousands of islands in the Aegean here. And uh, you know the six uh, nautical mile limit. On the second uh, side over here, we have uh, the same information if we are going, if Greece was going to extend that to 12 nautical miles like most countries in the world. And of course, this is at the crux of uh, the problems with Turkey. Today, it's the problems with Turkey, which, by the way, go back to the 1950s, although Greece and Turkey joined the NATO back then, you know, the uh, tensions uh, continue, and uh, the main emphasis uh, difference was on uh, this Aegean area. The whole problem, however, must be placed in the context, and uh, today's world, following uh, the United uh, Nations uh, Conference on the Law of the Sea, the top uh, shifted from uh, you know the territorial seas to uh, exclusive economic zones, as they are called, AOS in Greek. And here is the picture, the map, if you are going to apply this to Greece. This is the Greece, uh, the Greek, uh, you know, uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, here is the Turkish point of view. And uh, you see how things uh, get uh, complicated. Uh, 
hear it by native Cyprus and hear how the Turks, you know, view this. It is a completely different uh, from uh, you know, what everybody else would uh, think. Before I go to the next uh, topic, I would also like to uh, uh, bring up some information regarding uh, another current topic uh, in this relation with Turkey. All of these uh, refugees that they have been sending, fleeing the wars in Syria, in uh, Afghanistan, all of these uh, turbulent places in the Middle East. And as we see from this, Greece has become a major recipient, the staging ground, as we all know, we have seen in the news in the last uh, few years from these places. Okay, so that's another major issue. The last uh, issue that I want to talk is uh, the issue of uh, exploitation of hydrocarbons uh, oil and uh, natural gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is uh, uh, Cyprus here, and uh, this is a map that uh, the Ministry of Energy and uh, Commerce uh, and Industry of Cyprus has uh, published. The Cypriots started uh, ahead of uh, Greece in this respect much earlier on, and uh, they were very aggressive. We are to the point now where, you know, exploitation is about to start down here in the Aphrodite uh, natural uh, gas uh, field, as it is called. Uh, it is estimated that uh, it has about 4.1 trillion cubic feet uh, to be produced. And uh, also in uh, block uh, six, we also have uh, here is, uh, you know, the numbers here is six. And that is the Calypso field, as they named it, which uh, provides actually an extension of the Zor uh, field in Egypt, further south, and of course to the uh, east, uh, southeast with Israel. Uh, another one is uh, in 2019, block 10 here. Here is uh, 9, 10, is the Blogos field, they call it where they calculate that there are about five to eight uh, uh, trillion cubic feet of natural gas. And uh, there has been all kinds of, you know, uh, talks, uh, memoranda or uh, understanding, all kinds of things uh, regarding how to get this oil out from this Levantine area, they call it right here, south, southeast of Cyprus. You see the Israeli, Fields here, Tamar, uh, in particular, one of the biggest ones. Here is Aphrodite Cyprus, Zor in Egypt, and uh, Leviathan, all of these other ones. So the point is that uh, they may construct a pipeline here in Cyprus, you know, all the way to Crete and Greece and beyond. Uh, we'll see how much of all of these things are going to come to pass. The Turks are very active in the area. Every, this past uh, year, a lot of uh, uh exploration by them a lot of tensions with greece uh we don't have the time to go into detail about a lot of these but uh, the tensions i'm sure are going to continue as when this the natural gas and oil possibly uh surface because it's of a big uh, a big scale so this is uh where we are last uh a week ago, maybe the Cypriots and uh, the Israelis and the Greeks signed a memorandum of understanding of uh, actually integrating electricity uh, grids and uh, sinking uh, cables, you know, to take, take it to Greece. We'll see uh, how that is, you know, going to go. There is uh, another picture, another map of this East Med pipeline, as it is called. We are talking about a major project of uh, something like a couple of thousand per kilometer long, major expense. It needs multi uh, companies, uh, international, multinational companies to cooperate, countries to take out again the Leviathan, the Levantine basin uh, hydrocarbons to Europe through the area. So uh, to bring it uh, to maybe over the weekend with the 
declaration by President Biden and uh, you know the role of the uh, US in particular, still very active in Greece. In fact, uh, right now, the US has upgraded, we should say, uh, facilities in Suda Bay in particular, and in uh, Larissa and some other bases in Greece. Uh, the same uh, thing that happened with the war of independence when the big powers at the time, the British, the French, the Russians, uh, were involved in bringing about, uh, you know, the modern state of Greece. We have the big powers still involved uh, in this part of the world, and they are going to be more so involved uh, in these uh, power struggles between uh, Greece and uh, Turkey, especially when it comes to this uh, all important uh, natural gas, hydrocarbons that have been found in the area. We hope that uh, you know Greece and Cyprus together, maybe they will uh, forge this uh, stronger uh, position because having the justice on your side, as we have the Greeks have found out so many times, is not enough in any time in today's world. You know, with the power structure and uh, the converging interests in this region of the world. We, I personally hope that this uh, uh, tension between Israel and Turkey will work to the benefits of uh, Cypriots and the uh, Greeks, you know, to fend off any possible uh, Turkish designs against uh, uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. That was excellent. Thank you. Next, we have uh, a short uh, video presentation put together by the Goyans here at Akron Annunciation, who will share with us um, why uh, and what uh, Greek independence uh, means to them, why it's important to them, and why are they are proud of their heritage. And here we go. Kerete. My name is Katerina Tsarucha, and I love my culture. It makes me proud to not only be part of, but to take part in my heritage. I am proud to be a Greek American, knowing that my ancestors have fought for all of Greece, all of us, and for our future, even if that meant theirs was taken away. Otan akuo, ikosipati martiu, skeftome eleftheria dimokratia ketisia. Nyotho para poli perifani, tus agonistes tu ikosiana, keti choris, tis energies, keto pathos tus, Δεν θα υπήρχε ούτε Ελλάδα ούτε Ελληνισμό. Άρα δεν θα γνώριζα την ελληνική μου καταγωγή και την εθνικότητά μου και δεν θα βρισκόμουν εδώ μπροστά σα σήμερα. Γι' αυτό δεν πρέπει ποτέ να ξεχάσουμε τι ρίζε μα. Hello, I'm Dean Williams. Zito Frindon, a long live freedom. The 200th anniversary of Greek independence from the Ottoman Turks reminds us that freedom is never guaranteed. In fact, throughout history, most people have lived under some sort of dictatorship. As an American of Greek descent, I'm proud of my Hellenic heritage, which is inspired by the democracy we enjoy today. My grandparents and great-grandparents came to the United States for its great opportunities. I am grateful for my grandparents who had the courage to come to America while maintaining their love for orthodoxy and our Greek culture. I'm equally proud of my Hellenic heritage in Greece's two centuries of freedom. Zito Frindon. Long live freedom. Pharmakitis, what kind of name is that? We've all been asked this question and I can proudly say it's Greek. Why am I proud? There's many reasons. To start, there's my Orthodox religion, where at a young age, I was baptized in the church and through Sunday school, I was taught about the sacraments and our Orthodox faith. I was forced to go to Greek school by my parents because they were forced to as well. However, 
I'm glad that I did because I learned about traditions, customs, and the Greek language. And lastly, I'm proud of my Greek family. Family to Greeks is deeper than blood. It's a sense of community and pride in our ancestry, which brings us all together. We rejoice in each other's victories and accomplishments as a sense of heritage. Being Greek to me is summed up by one word, philotimo, a concept of honor, integrity, pride, and courage. Yasu, my name is Dionysi Tsirambidis, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Καλύτερα μιας ώρας ελεύθερη ζωή παρά 40 χρόνια σκλαβιά και φυλακή. It is better to have one hour of freedom than 40 years of slavery in prison. Growing up in the Greek culture and attending Greek school, these words are ingrained in me as a reminder of what our ancestors endured. However, it never really meant much to me. It was always just memorize this for your Greek school play. I am a second generation Bondian Greek American. I have been involved in the Bondian Youth Federation, which has taught me about a dark period in Greek history. And this history will serve me well because it grounds me and makes me grateful for all the things that I have. My grandparents were orphaned children surviving what is known as the world's first modern genocide. Their parents were killed during the Greek genocide because they lived in Bondos and Smyrna as Christians and were persecuted for their different beliefs. My grandparents went from Ottoman Turkey to Greece as part of a population exchange and then started over again in mainland Greece and then again when they began their lives in Athens and Cleveland, Ohio. Tienoi i mera tis eleftheria siamena me liga loia ine otan mea gineka so horiotu papumu purigos ilias mui perto. I pondi ine diofores elines. E ati teleporithikan diofores. I progenismu anexan to dromo e ati zoimu na ine kaliteri aputi dikitus. Ke tote desa paro tine eleftheria ke tis eskeriesmu os dedomeno. Efkaristo. My name is Alexia Konstantinopoulos, and I'm from Akron, Ohio. I'm proud to be Greek because it has not only led me to my faith, but to a community. Being raised Greek has taught me respect, discipline, work ethic, and ambition. Seeing how my yas and papus all came from Greece and made a life for themselves has taught me that I should make a legacy for myself. I'm proud to be Greek American because it has allowed me to embrace my culture while also taking advantage of the amazing opportunities America has to offer. I'm proud to be from a beautiful country like Greece, but also very grateful for the amazing opportunities America has. Hello everyone. With the bicentennial of Greek independence approaching, we look back at our past and those who gave us our freedom. Their will to fight not just for themselves and their families, but for the future Greek generations make me truly proud and honored to call myself a Greek. Being raised by Greek parents and grandparents, I've learned so much about our traditions and culture, as well as my family, the, the whole community and citizens who make up our parish taught me many valuable lessons as well. These are the lessons they learned from their ancestors, and their ancestors learned from the ones who came before them, the ones who fought for our ability to celebrate our wonderful heritage with events like festivals and social gatherings. Some of my closest friends are Greek, and our Greek roots are responsible. I once again honor and appreciate those who fought for our freedom and thank them and their descendants for giving me the privilege and joy of being Greek. I won't soon forget what you have done for me, and I hope to someday raise my own children with the same honor and pride that you all lived your lives with. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophia Kitchadimas, and I'm proud to be Greek for many reasons. One reason why I'm proud to be Greek is because it gives me a strong sense of faith and family in my daily life. Another reason why I'm so proud to be Greek is because of Greece's historical and cultural significance in today's world. I feel like every year my teachers in school have brought up Greece in one way or another, whether it was literature, architecture, democracy, or more, and it's pretty cool to be able to tell people that you're Greek. 200 years ago, the Greeks established their independence from the Turks after many centuries under their rule. And as a Greek American in the 21st century, I can proudly say I feel a great amount of pride knowing that my ancestors were dedicated, strong-willed, and overall courageous people that were able to fight for their freedom. March 25th is a day I hold dear in my heart because it's the day that has allowed me to indulge in my culture and it has afforded me the opportunity to build long-lasting relationships with others in the Greek community. I feel inexplicably fortunate to have grown up with the people that I will keep in touch with for the rest of my life, among other things. 
I truly don't know where or who I would be if I didn't have this amazing foundation in my life. I have had and will always have a deep adoration for my culture and the people within it. Zico Yelas. As we celebrate the bicentennial of March 25th, we honor those in our culture who sacrificed everything for Greek independence. Their perseverance and dedication have allowed a heritage so strong to not merely exist, but to flourish over the past two centuries. Growing up in a Greek community, I was immersed in many aspects of the heritage, including the language, faith, and other traditions. I am forever grateful to my ancestors for preserving the Greek culture and thus creating circumstances conducive for incredible opportunities like Greek dancing and Goy events that give me a sense of family and unconditional belonging. With these aspects of the culture, among others, I feel an inherent connection to the people with whom I share a Greek background, as I am forever thankful for the memories and lifelong relationships that I've established. I am beyond proud to be Greek. Yes, us. My name is Panos Tsaroukas, and I am proud to be Greek because it gives me pride and courage. Knowing that such a small country defeated a country that was occupying it for hundreds of years is truly inspiring. I wake up every morning embracing my culture and knowing there's nothing that will stand in between. Θέλω να μεταδίδω την, ελλη... την ελληνική ιστορία, παράδοση και γλώσσα στα παιδιά μας για να ζήσει ο ελληνισμός για πάντα. Ευχαριστώ. Very good. Thank the Goyans for that performance. Uh, next, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Rick Newton, Professor Emeritus of Classics of Kent State University, where he taught language and literature uh, courses in ancient Greek, Latin, and modern Greek for over 30 years. During that time, he received the Distinguished Teaching Award from the College of Arts and Sciences and served as chairman of the Modern and Classical Languages Department for 13 years. Dr. Newton has published well over 60 articles on Homer, Sophocles, Euripides, Nikos Kazantzakis, and Yanis Ritsos. He has also translated several modern Greek poets and prose writers. In 2002, he received the Elizabeth Konstantinidis Translation Prize from the Modern Greek Studies Association of America and Canada. Dr. Newton is also well known to us. He is a member of our community. And uh, Professor Newton, thank you for joining us today to talk about why we should never forget. Is uh, Dr. Newton with us? Here we go. It looks like uh, Dr. Newton, are you with us? I see you have uh, your PowerPoint on the screen. Okay. Okay, how's that? There we go. Dr. Newton, thank you. And thank you for being here today. And I see uh, Dr. Evangeline Newton there with you giving you some instruction. Tell him to unmute himself. And you may have muted yourself, uh, Dr. Newton. Okay. okay. How's that? Okay. Interesting. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. I want to thank you, Tony, for putting the, this program together, for inviting me. I love that you involve the kids. That's great. Thank um, you. Uh, uh, as I was preparing for today's uh, program, I thought it would be worthwhile to ask the question, why? After 200 years of Greek independence, why should Greek Americans commem commemorate this event? Most Greek Americans in our own and in many other communities come from American-born parents and even American-born grandparents. So the question is, why should we perpetuate this component of our identity into the 21st century? Two answers come readily to mind. The first one is pretty obvious. Nostalgia and family memories. 
as children, at our parents' insistence, as we just heard from some of the kids, uh, we would don fustaneles, Amalia costumes, and then we would carry flags, march on the church hall stage, and recite poems about shaking off the Turkish yoke. We celebrate March 25th simply because it's a, a tradition. It's something that Greek Americans do. But the second reason I think calls for a closer examination, and that's religion. March 25th, as we all know, is a double holiday. The Annunciation of the Theotokos and the commencement of the revolution. The Archangel's greeting to the Virgin, Hail Mary, full of grace, is echoed in the Greek national anthem, Hail Liberty, Hail. The date of March 25th was actually chosen on purpose by the 1821 heroes in order to place the liberation of the people within the context of the liberation of mankind from our enslavement to the foe. This is the hymn we actually sang just last Sunday, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. In this way, the Greeks managed to universalize their individual struggle and their victory into a feast for all of, all of mankind. This is why the Greek flag displays the cross. Patriotism and faith are literally interwoven. This is the legacy that holds implications for us today. I think it compels us to think beyond family tradition, beyond national pride, beyond just what we do, and connect with humanity as a whole. For historians, one of the most impressive features of the 1821 movement is this. After the Greeks emerged from 400 years of Ottoman subjugation, they were still Orthodox Christians. In his book, The Great Church in Captivity, Byzantine historian Sir Stephen Runciman examines the steadfast refusal of the Byzantines during these years to appeal to the West for help. And by West, he means the Roman Catholic Church. To accept this aid came with strings attached, which the Byzantines rejected. To accept Western support would mean three things in particular, and I've got them here in bullets. First, it would require the adoption of the filioque, a Latin insertion into the Nicene Creed that was, uh, that was put there by the Roman church in the year 589. Second, it would require acknowledgement of the primacy of the Pope in matters of both doctrine and administration. These differences resulted in the great schism of 1054, a rift between the Eastern and Western church that is yet to be mended. Third, it would require the sanctioning of the sacking of Constantinople by the Crusaders in the year 1204. This attack, besides desecrating many sacred sites in that city, also brought about the deposition of most Orthodox bishops throughout the entire Middle East. This was a violation of the Orthodox doctrine of apostolic succession, which we also confess in the creed. Rather than abandon their core beliefs, the Byzantines opted to bear up under the Turkish yoke. But this came at a price. The Greeks were given derogatory Turkish names. A Greek was called a rayas, a slave, and a yaur, an infidel. The term yaur was so commonplace, in fact, that the Philhellene poet, Lord Byron, wrote a poem titled the, Yaw, the Jaur, the Yaur. He didn't even translate it, the, the infidel. The Byzantines, despite their second and third class status under the Ottomans, stood their ground. And they said, I would rather wear the fez of the Turk than the mitre of the Pope. Kalio Sariki Turkiko Baratia. So for 400 years, the Greeks held tight onto their roots. The modern poet Yanis Ritsos says this about roots. The roots don't show, and yet you know it's to them that the tree clings. The poem's main verb is kratiete, to cling, persevere, hold tight. The independence movement of 1821 came about after centuries of clinging to roots. But what exactly are these roots? When we say the word Greek, our minds turn to the high culture of classical antiquity. English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley proclaimed in 1820, we are all Greeks. Our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts have their roots in Greece. To say Greece, even to an Englishman, is to conjure up an image of wise old men in tunics discussing philosophy and founding democracy. But that was the ancient past, the glory that was Greece. The modern story is not nearly so elevated. Long before the Ottomans came the Romans. In the year 146 BC, Corinth was sacked and all of Greece was renamed the Roman province of Achaia. The Venetians came in the 12th and 13th centuries. Then came the Ottomans, 1453. 
In the 20th century, the Young Turks came onto the scene with Ataturk and his protracted program of ethnic cleansing of non-Muslims. The genocide of the Armenians came first in 1916. The Greeks of the Black Sea, the Pontus, followed. The climax occurred in 1922, the destruction of Smyrna, Zmirni, and the loss of all of Asia Minor. This debacle is known as the Great Catastrophe, the Megali Catastrophe. Then in 1941 came occupation by the Nazis and the Great Starvation, the Megali Pina. In 1974, half of Greek Cyprus fell into Turkish hands when the military dictatorship of Papadopoulos collapsed. This is just a partial list of the many periods of Greek history. And I think it's little wonder that once Greek lyricist gives this summary, Greece, oh Greece, you live one year in peace and 30 in the fire. Anna Kronosis Irini, Ketriana Stifotia. Most recently in 2019, we saw the great church of the Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia, converted back into a mosque. Gritsos apostrophizes his homeland. So many enslavements, tos esclavies. What freedom have you won for me? You speak of no victories. You've got me chatting with sparrows. Sparrows, the commonest, the drabbest of birds, not the soaring double-headed eagle of the Byzantine empire. So Greece may be the birthplace of democracy, but she has gone through centuries in which she was not allowed to enjoy it. In another poem, Ritsos describes village women on the island of Milos, and they lament, at times our overlords were bad, at times worse, always worse. This is a very humble story. And these hard times, I would posit, stand side by side with the glory that was Greece. This history too is part of the intricate root system of the Greek tree. The most glowing example of this impact was, was manifested in 1965 when our own Archbishop of North and South America, Yakovos of Blessed Memory, marched in Selma, Alabama with Martin Luther King in support of civil rights. Yakovos appeared with King on the cover of Life magazine with the caption, Historic Turning Point. Yakovos was born in 1911 on the Turkish island of Imbros in the North Northeast Aegean Sea. He was a Ragyas, a non-Muslim subject of the Ottoman Empire. Here is how he describes his decision to march. And I've transcribed this statement from a voice recording of his. He says, unlike most of you, I was not born in the United States to enjoy democracy. I came here from Turkey, where I was a third category citizen. So when Martin Luther King Jr. had his walk to the courthouse of Selma, I decided to join him. And I said, this is my time to take revenge against all those who oppress people. Upon my return, someone called me prodoti, traitor. Some others that I should be ashamed of what I had done. Some that I'm not an American. Some that I'm not a Christian. I know that civil rights and human rights continue to be the most thorny social issue in our nation, but I will stand for both rights, civil and human, for as long as I live. I feel that this is a Christian duty, the duty of a man who was born as a slave. The date of the article, March 26, 1965, one day after the 144th anniversary of 1821. Yakovos clung to his roots and he connected with humanity. When victims of oppression overthrow their persecutors, they have a choice. Either they can identify a new victim to oppress and they can perpetuate the dark side of human history, or they can vow to put an end to all oppression and strive to end injustice. Yakovos chose the latter, even though he knew he would incur the criticism of his own compatriots. Writing some 25 years later, the Greek American sociologist Charles Moskus wrote, the archbishop's actions on civil rights were far in advance of the majority of his flock. Like the heroes of 1821 who made their personal liberation day a universal celebration of freedom, Yakovos took his individual story of oppression and universalized that into a lifelong commitment to oppose oppression in all its forms. He took the negative of his experience and reversed it into a positive and even into a virtue, even though his stance came at a price. This thought is encapsulated in another poem by Ritsos. Black on its other side is white. It is your job to reverse it. To mavro aptalotumeros asproine, vikisudulia nato adistrepsis. The story of modern Greece is not such a humble one after all. I think that its roots run as deep as those of the golden age of Pericles. In varying degrees, the Roman Greeks, the Vis Venetian Greeks, the Byzantine Greeks, the Ottoman Greeks, and the modern Greeks, 
have all lived persecution firsthand. They resisted and they overcame. When they did, they emerged more deeply connected to their value system. This explains, I think, why during the Nazi Holocaust, the Greeks gave shelter to their Jewish neighbors and saved thousands from deportation to the concentration camps. This philanthropy came with the risk of their own execution by German firing squads. It also explains why Greece is always the first country to send humanitarian aid to who? Turkey, when severe earthquakes strike that country. It explains why in this century, the small islands of Mytilene and Samos, to name just two, still take in Syrian refugees, despite the damage these actions wreak on their own economy and on their tourist trade. In 2016, the people of Mytilene were actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. The Greeks, in short, know what it means to be forced to leave one's homeland. Their prolonged personal experience has expanded their capacity for empathy and their ability to connect with others regardless of their religion or nationality. Their story has opened them up. Anixan is anthropy. So to answer my question, why should we remember this day? I would say this, to do so is to renew our commitment to a dual legacy, the legacy of the ancient high cultural achievement and the modern steadfast and defiant resolution to cling to roots that espouse the higher and universal truths. When we sing hail liberty hail, Quiero, quiero lefter ya. We give utterance to this commitment. Thank you. Kronimas pola. Thank you, Dr. Newton. That was terrific. Thank you very, very much. I love your tie, by the way. <laughs> Evangeline <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I would like to uh, introduce to us uh, our last speaker, all the way from, uh, from Kalamata, Greece. We would like to welcome uh, Dr. Nikolaos Zaharias. Dean of the School of Humanities and Cultural Studies at the University of Peloponnese and Professor of History, Archaeology and Cultural Resources Management and Director of the Laboratory of Archaeometry. He is the author of over 15 books and book chapters, has co-authored 120 scientific communications. He is the editor in Archaeometry for the Mediterranean Archaeology and Archaeometry Journal, chaired six international symposia and has participated at 25 national and EU, European Union funded research program. Dr. Zacharias has presented 175 papers at international symposia and has a total of 775 citations in peer review journals. Dr. Zacharias, welcome to the program and thank you very much for joining us. Good evening from Kalamata, Greece. and. Uh... I really thank you, uh, Mr. Tsaroukas, for the, for the kind invitation. I'm really honored to be with you on especially those days, these days of the bicentennial uh, celebrations. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you here and thank you for joining us. I know with the time difference, but I know you and your staff have been heavily involved in, um, if you, in your project, the Kalamata 1821 project, Roads of Freedom. Yes. This is what I would like to present you, but please allow me to share my screen. My screen. Yes, um, Dr. Newton, you may have to stop sharing so that. Um, okay. Here comes my assistant. See the red button there? There you go. We'll stop sharing at the top. Which one? Uh, go to the top. You'll see the bar there. Um, yeah, I see the bar. Here, you want here. Annotate? No. No. What do I want to get out of here? here? Go to the top of your bar, and there's a little tab. It'll be, there's a green tab and a red tab and it'll say, it'll say stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Stop video, I don't know here. You want to sit You have to move your, move your cursor up a little bit higher. There you go. See, this is not Dr. Uh, Newton's uh, strong suit. It's the <laughs> technology. Okay, did we stop? Yeah. I think you stop. have. Yeah, okay, good. Let's do this. Now, if we can uh, highlight, uh, spotlight Dr. Um, Zaharias, please. Yes. So my aim is to present you our project, uh, which runs since uh, 2018 until uh, this summer. Uh, Kalamata is, um, has a long tradition connected to associated with the uh, 1821 War of Independence. Um, it is the first liberated city since the start of this war. 
and uh, it is uh, uh, since uh, 1947 that it was recognized its significance in the history, the modern history of the country. The first uh, reactment took place in uh, 1952, and it, the celebrations are around the uh, the emblematic church of uh, Agi Apostoli at the old city center of Kalamata. We see the, the, the church on the right, uh, a late 9th, early 10th century uh, Byzantine church, and uh, some picture of the first celebrations, the black and white picture, and uh, a picture uh, in color of uh, what is uh, the most uh, uh, emblematic uh, we see every March on 23rd. Um, the traditions of the 18th and 19th century are strong in the Messina capital and introduced were every chance through dance, music, theatrical plays, and of course, uh, cuisine. Um, I would like to present you the project, Kalamata 1821 Roads of Freedom. Uh, uh, Kalamata is the, is the city I am uh, placed and uh, our university is placed. Uh, though I um, come from Mesologi, my hometown, my origin, another historical city, uh, those two cities I think are the most, uh, of the most uh, emblematic. Kalamata is the first liberated city and is equal to what Philadelphia stands for the United States. And Mesologi is the sacrifice, the, the, the city of the highest sacrifice of the war of independence. But please allow me to continue in Greek, uh, besides the PowerPoint is in English. Uh, uh, το Πανεπιστήμιο Πελοποννήσου ε, είναι σε όλη την περιφέρεια Πελοποννήσου στις πέντε κυριότερες πόλεις του. Την Κόρυθο, τον Άφλιο, τη Σπάρτη, την Καλαμάτα. Στην Τρίπολη είναι η κεντρική διοίκηση και εκτείνεται και στην πόλη της Πάτρας. Έχει εννέα σχολές για 22 τμήματα και προσφέρει 24 προπτυχιακά προγράμματα και 30 μεταπτυχιακά προγράμματα σε ένα σύνολο περίπου 30.000 φοιτητών και των τριών κατηγοριών προπτυχιακούς και μεταπτυχιακούς φοιτητές. Στο τμήμα Ιστορίας, Αρχαιολογίας και Διαχείρισης Πολιτισμικών Αγαθών υπάρχουν τρία εργαστήρια. Το εργαστήριο Αρχαιομετρίας, το εργαστήριο της Ενάλειας Αρχαιολογίας και το εργαστήριο της Μοντέρνας και Σύγχρονης Ιστορίας. Και υπάρχουν δύο μεταπτυχιακά προγράμματα τη νεότερη Ιστορίας και το μεταπτυχιακό Cultural Heritage Materials and Technologies, which is in το οποίο είναι στα αγγλικά. Α, το εργαστήριο αρχαιομετρίας, αυτό το, οποίο, το οποίο είναι η βάση για αυτά που θα σας παρουσιάσω, έχει ύπαρξη 10 χρόνια στο τμήμα ιστορίας αρχαιολογίας. Α, βλέπουμε το, τα μέλη της ομάδας, της ερευνητικής ομάδας και ειδικεύεται στις αναλύσεις αρχαιολογικών υλικών, στις απόλυτες χρονολογήσεις, στις, στην ανασύνση, ανασύνθεση του παλαιοπεριβάλλοντος και σε ψηφιακέ εφαρμογές. Βλέπουμε ε, τον εξοπλισμό και μερικά προγράμματα στα οποία έχει συμμετάσχει το πρόγραμμα ή έχει συντονίσει. Επάνω δεξιά, ίσως είναι το πιο πρόσφατο και από τα πιο αναγνωρίσιμα, είναι στα πλαίσια της αναστήλωσης του Παναγίου, τα άφωστα Ιεροσόλυμα, που το εργαστήριό μας έκανε τις χρονολογήσεις του μνημείου και δημοσίευση της ηλικία του μνημείου, πριν από 1,5 χρόνο περίπου. Το εργαστήριο ε, έχει το μεταπτυχιακό, το αγγλόφωνο μεταπτυχιακό πρόγραμμα Caltech, το οποίο ε, λειτουργεί από το 2015 και είναι από τα πρώτα στη χώρα που ξεκίνησαν στα αγγλικά. Μέχρι τώρα έχει εκπαιδεύσει 58 μεταπτυχιακούς φοιτητές και έχει παράξει μεγάλο αριθμό ερευνητικών εργασιών. Γιατί Καλαμάτα 1821, γιατί ξεκινήσαμε αυτή την περιπέτεια, την πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα περιπέτεια, πριν από τρία χρόνια. Και συγκεκριμένα, τον Δεκέμβριο του 2017, υποβάλαμε μια ευρωπαϊκή πρόταση για χρηματοδότηση, ώστε να μπορέσουμε να υλοποιήσουμε το 2021 δράσεις που αφορούν τους εορτασμούς της εκατοενταπηρίδος. Η Καλαμάτα είναι γνωστή για αυτή την μεγάλη πολιτική πράξη της απελευθέρωσής της, συντεταγμένα, 
στις 23 Μαρτίου του 1721. Είναι η πρώτη πολιτική πράξη. Το πρώτο ελεύθερο έδαφος στα Βαλκάνια, στον νότο των Βαλκανίων, στην Ελλάδα, που αποτέλεσε μια πρώτη ανεξάρτητη χώρα, γιατί ήταν ο ορισμός της δημιουργίας ενός κράτους. Όλοι οι πολίτες εξεγείρονται, επαναστατούν, μιλούν για εθνεγερσία, δηλαδή για ανύψωση του γένους, α, καταλύουν τις αρχές, ε, δημιουργούν το δικό τους σύστημα πολιτικό και τη στρατιωτική ηγεσία και στη συνέχεια χαράσουν την πολιτική της, α, του πώς θα κινηθεί η επανάσταση στην υπόλοιπη Πελοπόννησο. Το πρόγραμμα έχει προσπάθησε και προ, έχει, πιστεύουμε, καταφέρει σε πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό να ενωποιήσει την ιστορία, τη μνήμη, την παράδοση του 21 μαζί με τα κοινωνικά δρόμενα τα οποία γίνονται στις μέρες μας αλλά αντανακλούν την ιστορία του 21 που έχουν τη βάση τους, δηλαδή, στο 1821 με σκοπό να ανακαλύψουμε πάλι το παρελθόν, να χρησιμοποιήσουμε τις αξίες του παρελθόντος και να μπορέσουμε να δώσουμε ανάπτυξη, βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη στην πόλη, στην περιοχή, στη χώρα, στον τουρισμό. Πιστεύουμε, πιστεύω ότι η, το, το, η περίοδος του 21, του 1821, ο 19ος αιώνας, είναι, παρέχει τα υλικά με τα οποία έχει φτιαχτεί το σύγχρονο DNA της χώρας. Ό,τι είμαστε σήμερα σε πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό οι πολίτες της χώρας έχουν τις ρίζες τους, έχει τις ρίζες του στο 1821. Ο τρόπος που σκεφτόμαστε, ο τρόπος που αντιδρούμε, η, α, ακόμα και η κουλτούρα, η πολιτιστική και η, η, ακόμα και η κουλτούρα στο φαγητό παραμένει σε πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό α, να έχει α, τις ρίζες της, τις βάσεις της στο 1821. Ενώ παράλληλα η χώρα έχει κάνει τεράστιο άλμα σε αυτά τα 200 χρόνια. Δημιουργήσαμε, σχεδιάσαμε τέσσερα προϊόντα. Το ένα ήταν να δημιουργήσουμε μία ταινία. Μία ταινία η οποία να είναι μια, ένα δραματοποιημένο ντοκιμαντέρ και να φυγείτε την, α, τον, α, 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 την κουλτούρα και τον αέρα της, α, των χρόνων της Επανάστασης από το 1819 μέχρι το 1827, μέχρι την αμαχία του Ναβαρίνου ουσιαστικά. Η ταινία αυτή έχει ολοκληρωθεί και βρίσκεται στο στάδιο του Μοντάζ. Το δεύτερο προϊόν μας είναι η δημιουργία ενός ψηφιακού μουσείου στην πόλη, με τίτλο «Καλαμάτα 1821, ψηφιακό μουσείο». Το τρίτο μας προϊόν ήταν να ενοποιήσουμε όλες τις δράσεις που κάνει η πόλη και να τις μεγαλώσουμε. Αντί για τρεις ημέρες εορτασμού κάθε μήνα τον Μάρτιο, τις κάναμε ένα μήνα εορτασμού. Και ξεκινήσαμε από το 2019 πυροτικά και ολοκληρωμένα τον Μάρτιο του 2020, με 52 δράσεις σε όλο τον μήνα. Για να, για να πραγματοποιηθούν αυτές οι δράσεις, έπρεπε να συνθέσουμε όλους τους φορείς. Τόσο τους φορείς της πόλης, αλλά και τις συλλογικότητες. Τα σχολεία, το πανεπιστήμιο. Όλοι σχεδίασαν και μπορούσαν να εφαρμόσουν κάτι. Δυστυχώ, οι εκδηλώσεις σταμάτησαν στα μισά του μήνα Μαρτίου πέρσι, γιατί ξεκίνησε η πανδημία στη χώρα και ο εγκλεισμός. Για φέτος, το μήνα Μάρτιο, σχεδιάσαμε και υλοποιήσαμε ε, βίβλιο παρουσιάσεις, ανακαλύπτοντας βιβλία τα οποία ήταν α, όχι τόσο γνωστά στην πόλη, αλλά και κρίνοντας νέες συλλογές, οι οποίες αφορούσαν την παράδοση και την ιστορία του 1821. Το τελευταίο ήταν να δημιουργήσουμε το εμπορικό σήμα Καλαμάτα 1821. Λέγοντας εμπορικό σήμα, εννοούμε μία σειρά προϊόντων, τόσο της α, αγροτικής παραγωγής, όσο και προϊόντων της διατροφής, αλλά και φιλοξενίας, τουρισμού, που θα είχαν ένα κοινό χαρακτηριστικό. Θα είχαν αναγωγή στην περίοδο του 1821. Ένα αποτέλεσμα από την επωνυμία ήταν και οι γεύσεις του 1921, τις οποίες α, παρουσιάσαμε. Ε, τις βλέπουμε εδώ μέσα από μερικές ε, εκδηλώσεις που υλοποιήσαμε το 2020, ώστε να γνωρίσει η επιχειρηματική κοινότητα της πόλης τι μπορεί να κάνει με τις γεύσεις του παρελθόντος, με τις γεύσεις των παππούδων μας, με την παραδοσιακή διατροφή. Με τη διατροφή που στο μεγαλύτερο μέρος της χώρας παραμένει η βάση του να είναι παραδοσιακή. Τα προϊόντα να είναι παραδοσιακά και οι προσεγγίσεις επίσης των πρώτων υλών να είναι 
ε, αυθεντικές ακόμα. Έτσι δημιουργήσαμε μία σειρά καρτών για τα μουσεία και τα ξενοδοχεία της πόλης, διανθισμένα με ιστορίες από περιηγητές. Βλέπουμε ένα απόσπασμα από τον Βίλιαμ Τζέλ, ο οποίος είχε περιηγηθεί τον Μωρέ, την Πελοπόννησο, δηλαδή το 1823, και περιγράφει τις διατροφικές συνήθειες των Ελλήνων εκείνης της περίοδου. Τα, οι κάρτες αυτές, οι οποίες βρίσκονται στα εστιατόρια της πόλης, για όλο το χρόνο, είναι στα ελληνικά και στα αγγλικά. Και το προϊόν της ταινία. Η ταινία, άνεμος ελευθερίας, έχει, είναι ένα αφήγημα το οποίο ξεκινάει στις αρχές του 19ου αιώνα. Οι περισσότεροι, πιστεύω, θα θυμάστε ότι στα, στις αρχές του 1900-1910 υπήρξε η μόδα της χρωμολιθογραφίας στην Ελλάδα. Ήταν η περίοδος που οι μορφές των ηρών του 21 α, αναπαρίχθησαν σε μεγάλη κλίμακα και διαδόθηκαν σε όλη τη χώρα. Με αυτές διακοσμούνταν μέχρι πρόσφατα τα σχολεία, τα σπίτια, οι μορφές του Κολοκοτρώνη, του Καραϊσκάκη, του Αθανασίου Διάκου. Ένας λοιπόν χρωμολιθογράφος το 1910, ο οποίος κατασκευάζει χρωμολιθογραφίες, ζωντανεύει, τη ζωντανεύει αυτές και αρχίζει το ταξίδι τους με το καράβι που έρχεται από το Αϊβαλή, από τις κειδωνιές της Μικράς Ασίας, φορτωμένο με εφόδια και έρχεται στην Μεσσηνιακή Μάνη για να δώσει τα πρώτα εφόδια για την ένταξη του αγώνα. Και αρχίζει μετά ένα ταξίδι μέσα από ένα κεντρικό πρόσωπο, ενός φιλικού του Φίλωνα, ο οποίος περιηγείται την Νότιο Πελοπόννησο, βλέπει την κουλτούρα των ανθρώπων, προετοιμάζεται, συνομιλεί με άλλους φιλικούς, μας μεταφέρει το πνεύμα της εποχής, τη μεγάλη αγωνία, την προετοιμασία την κουλτούρα, την αρχιτεκτονική, τη μουσική της περίοδου αυτής και η ταινία καταλήγει με τη σκηνή που βλέπουμε επάνω που είναι το 1828, η χώρα είναι ελευθερωμένη σε δύο χρόνια αργότερα επίσημα θα έχουμε και την ίδρυση της ανεξάρτητης ελληνικής πολιτείας με τη συνθήκη του Λονδίνου του 1830 είμαστε το 1828 λοιπόν που πλέον υπάρχει ελεύθερο κράτος και σε ένα σχολείο ο φιλικός ο ίδιος αφηγείται την ιστορία αυτή των πρώτων χρόνων της Ελληνικής Επαναστάσεως. Και τους μιλάει για την ελευθερία, για τη φλόγα, για την διαφορετικότητα, για τη γλώσσα και τη θρησκεία, που ήταν η βάση, ο πυρήνας, να εξεγερθούν και να δημιουργήσουν το δικό τους κράτος. Αν συγκρίνουμε την εικόνα αυτή, η οποία είναι εικόνα από την ταινία, από τη σκηνή, με την οποία τελειώνει η ταινία, με τη σημερινή Ελλάδα καταλαβαίνουμε την πρόοδο που έχει συντελεστεί στη χώρα, και σε όλο τον νότο των Βαλκανίων και διεθνώς ασφαλώς. Αλλά πιστεύουμε ότι αυτό που πρέπει εμείς να α, αξιοποιούμε σε μέγιστο βαθμό, γιατί είναι ανεξάντλητο, είναι η πλούσια παράδοση του 1821, η οποία σε περιοχές όπως η Πελοπόννησος είναι παντού. Και προσφέρεται. Προσφέρεται όχι μόνο να δώσει λύσεις α, στην καθημερινότητα των ανθρώπων, αλλά μπορεί να βοηθήσει σε αυτό που λέμε βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη. Και το άλλο προϊόν που σχεδιάσαμε και υλοποιήσαμε είναι το ψηφιακό μουσείο Καλαμάτα 1821, το οποίο άνοιξε τις πύλες του τον Οκτώβριο του περασμένου έτους, του Οκτώβριο του 20, το οποίο είναι εμβληματικό για την πόλη της Καλαμάτας, φιλοξενείται στο ισόγειο του Παλαιού Δημαρχείου, στο ιστορικό κέντρο της πόλης, και είναι στην λειτουργία από τότε. Βέβαια, ενδιάμεσα έχει διακοπή η λειτουργία του. Πιστεύουμε ότι α, αρχές Απριλίου, που ξεκινάνε πάλι οι επισκέψεις που μπορεί να ανοίξουν πάλι τα μουσεία, θα μπορούμε να το επισκεπτόμαστε πάλι. Αυτό είναι το εσωτερικό του μουσείου, το οποίο αποτελείται από τρεις βιντεοθόνες, οι οποίες ενημερώνουν το κοινό για τα σημεία ενδιαφέροντα στην πόλη, που αφορούν εκδηλώσεις οι οποίες σχετίζονται με το 19ο αιώνα. Μία, μία οθόνη επίσης η οποία έχει αποσπάσματα συνεντεύξεων για την ιστορία της πόλης του 1821 και δύο διαταστικές τράπεζες, οι άλλοι είναι στην επόμενη γωνία, οι οποίες α, έχουν τρεις ιστορίες παιχνίδια. Είναι διαδραστικές και με αυτές μπορείς να βρεις την αντανάκληση των ιστοριών, την αντανάκληση της πόλης όσον αφορά το 1821. Τα κτίρια, τα οποία έχουν μνήμη, 
ή τις μορφές των ηρών που παραπέμπουν σε, σε συγκεκριμένα σημεία της πόλης. Είναι ένα παιχνίδι, το παιχνίδι του κρυμμένου θησαυρού, το παιχνίδι της ιστορίας της πόλης. Γιατί πόλεις όπως η Καλαμάτα μπορούν να στηρίζουν τον τουρισμό τους Εκτός από τη μνήμη τους, μπορούν να στηρίζουν τον τουρισμό τους και την οικονομία σε μεγάλο βαθμό σε αυτή την πολύ πλούσια παράδοση του 1821. Είναι ένα σημείο αναφοράς το ψηφιακό μουσείο, το οποίο διανθίζεται από αυτόν τον εγκληματικό πίνακα του Δημητρίου Δράκου, που δείχνει την απελευθέρωση της Καλαμάτας στις 23 του Μάρτου του 1821, μπροστά από τους Αγίους Αποστόλους. Και μια συλλογή αυθεντικών κοιμηλίων, αυθεντικών όπλων, τα οποία παραχωρήθηκαν από την αρχαιολογική υπηρεσία μεσηνίας του Υπουργείου Πολιτισμού. Αυτά. Θα ήθελα να κλείσουμε με μια μικρή παρουσίαση του τρέιλερ, του επίσημου τρέιλερ, το οποίο είναι σε λειτουργία από χθε. Εμεί, ετρεί γενναί, υποσχόμεθα με τη δύναμη των ρηθέντων φοβερών όρκων να βασιλεύει στο εξή στα σώματά μα μία ψυχή, μία σύμπνοια, μία θέληση για το γενικό συμφέρον τη πατρίδο μα. Ελλάδος. Η Φιλίπη Εταιρεία μου πολύ νωρίς προσβλέπει στην συμμετοχή της Μάνης στην Επανάσταση και στέλνει τον Χριστόφορο Περεγού για να ασχοληθεί με το αντικείμενο. Αυτά που λένε οι Ξουγάλους, που συνόλουν να το διακόνουν. Τα λένε αυτοί που θέλουν να μας κρατήσουν στο σκοτάδι και στη λαμάφια. Δεν προκόβει άνθρωπος χωρίς την αγκαιστηρία. Εις αυτή την αθλίαν κατάσταση νόντες αποφασίσαμε ή να ελευθερωθούμε ή να αποθάνουμε. Εις αυτή την ιστορία διαλαμβάνονται για τον αναγνώστη πράξεις και κατορθώματα, τα οποία όσοι δεν είδουν θα τα πιστεύουν ως αλόκοτο και φανταστικά. Αλλά εγώ δεν παραξενεύομαι, διότι ήμουν ο ίδιος αυτόπτης εις την σπουδαιότερα στιγμή του Γιάννη. Ο φρίξος φίλων έχει συνέστηση της ιστορικής στιγμής. Είναι μάρτυρας των ιστορικών δρόμων. Είναι δημιουργός αλλά και ήρωας ενός λαϊκού αναγνώσματος που δεν πρόλαβε να εκδοθεί. Τι θα μας φέρει το ταξίδι. Ελευθερία. Τύπωναν βιβλία τα οποία διοικητεύονταν στην Ανατολή, τόσο στη Βενετού Κρατούμα, όσο και στην Οθωμανική κυριαρχία. Επομένω, μέσω τη διασπορά γίνεται μια βελτίωση ε, τη ελληνική εκπαίδευση. Οι ιδέε του Ρίγα δεν φυλακίζονται. Ούτε στραγγαλίζονται. Η εταιρεία απλωνόταν γρήγορα στη Μοριά. Εγώ ω έμπορο και ο ακατάβλητο περαιγό συνεχίζαμε με ορμή το έργο τη. Υπομονή και προσοχή. Μέρο από του παράδε πηγαίνει για το μεγάλο σκοπό. Αργά παίζεται το όνειρο. Ο μηχανισμό τη Οθωμανική Αυτοκρατορία. Ποιο είναι το κεφάλι που θα επισκέψει στην πόλη. Δεν βλέπει με καθόλου καλό μάτι αυτή την αυξανόμενη δράση των κλειστών. Πώ τι άλλο βράχη που το πάρει το έργο. Α το βράχη, θα πάει και την Ισά. Η Ελληνική Επανάσταση ήταν ένα πολύ μεγάλο θαύμα. Αλλά παράλληλα και μια αποτυχία. Γιατί ένα πολύ μεγάλο κομμάτι αυτών των ανθρώπων παραμένει υπόδουλο. Α. Μη. Ο Θεόδρος Κολοκοτρώνης οδεύει πλέον προς την Λεωνίδιο μάχη, μία μάχη η οποία οδηγεί με μαθηματική ακρίβεια στην θυσία. Να προσπαθήσετε να συνάξετε παλικάρια, άρματα, μπαρούπι, βόλια. Αν λοιπόν, φίλοι τα τέμου Κολοκοτρώνη, εναγκαλιστείτε την ομόνια, να είστε βέβαιοι ότι με τη βοήθεια του προστάτου της δικαιοσύνης, Θέλετε στεφανώσει τα σκεφαλά σα με του αμαράντε στεφάνου τη δόξα. Σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Πάρα πολύ ωραία, υπέροχα. Σας ευχαριστούμε, κυρία Ζαχαρία. Τον τόπο τον οποίο κατοικούμε...
Ωραία, σας ευχαριστούμε. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, now brings our program to a conclusion. Uh, we're a little bit over on time, but still have some time for some questions. So if uh, you have any, send them over. We'll look out for them on, oh, I think I just missed one, but nonetheless, uh, send your questions over and direct it to the speaker. Uh, and I'll actually start it with a couple questions. I'd like to start with Dr. Uh, uh, Molly Green, if uh, Dr. Green is still with us. Sorry, yes, I am. I was muted. Oh, good. Oh. Dr. Green, you know, two questions, actually. Number one, what interested you in sort of studying the uh, Ottoman history and, and actually its occupation of the Balkans? Um, I guess I've always been interested in, um, in hidden histories, not the histories that are displayed, like the history of classical Greece, but the, the histories that are, uh, that are not as well known. I'm always uh, drawn to that. Uh, in the summer of 2015, I, um, I, had, I took a Princeton class of undergraduates to, um, to Thessaloniki uh, to study the, the subject was the history of the city of Thessaloniki. And it was interesting to talk about why uh, Thessaloniki, which historically was a much more important city than Athens, um, uh, is so much less well known. Right? A lot of people in the US don't even know that Thessaloniki exists. So I've always interested in the history that is less on display. Um, and then I am, um, I am um, uh, um, fascinated by how extremely complex and international um, the Greek world was um, under the Ottomans. Um, I, I always tell my students, um, um, you know, they might have some sense that in Central Europe, you know, for centuries, um, you know, wherever you were from, whether you were a German speaker or not, if you wanted to move to the city, if you wanted to get an education, if you wanted to join the church, if you wanted to um, become a merchant, um, uh, you, you wrote in German. And, uh, and gr the Greek language performed that function uh, across the Balkans, across much of Anatolia and even the Middle East um, for Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you know, it's why if you go to Jordan now on the Dead Sea and look at look at uh, icons. I mean, there's there's a, a Greek lettering. So so that the vastness and complexity of, of that world um, interests me. The other question was with some of the points made about you know current events today. Do you see are you able to compare contrast or see any similarities between foreign policy of um, the Ottoman Empire versus uh, today's you know today's uh, modern day Turkey's policies? No, we live in a completely different international climate, uh, different ideas about sovereignty. And Turkey is a nation state and the Ottoman Empire um, uh, was, uh, uh, was an empire and, and they behave very, very differently. I mean, I think the big difference is, is um, I would emphasize differences. This part of the world, Eastern Mediterranean from um, you know, around the time of the birth of Christianity until 1924, to a great extent, I mean, there were small states like Greece after 1821, was organized as an empire. Uh, and empires uh, operate very, very uh, differently than, uh, than nation states. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Gallant, I, we have a question for you. Are you still with us? Ah, uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, excellent. So I'm gonna ask you to hypothecate for a moment. And that is, if we go back in time, and if uh, Ioannis Kapodistrias is not assassinated, do you see that uh, Greece's history would have been any different after that point in time, as you indicated, when the monarchy, you know, being installed and then uh, governing Greece for the next uh, six, seven decades, if not greater? Yes, yes, indeed, it would be. It would have been completely different. How there so? were discussions, and Greece was going to be, uh, was going to get a monarch. So it would, be, it would be a constitutional monarchy, but it would still be democracy. And it would have been different because by the time the new monarch would have been appointed, which probably would have been in the mid 1830s, Kabbalistrius' policies, which were already making major inroads in, in dealing with the devastation of the war, I think that you would have had a strong executive when the monarch came in, particularly say if it was Otto, who was still you know, a teenager, then the dynamic would have been very, very different. The period of absolutism, the Bavarokatia, um, left a lasting imprint. Some of it good in Greece, some of it bad. Um, but yeah, we would, have, we would have lived in a very different place um, if Kapodistrius had not been assassinated. 
you made a a reference to you know the um, sort of a, a revolutionary time period in the 1800s leading up to uh, and prior to that, prior to the revolution of Greece, uh, um, you know, in various parts of the world, whether it was the United States, France, you know, Russia, did that have some impact on the superpowers, you know, willingness to help Greece initially, or maybe some hesitancy initially because there was some anti-revolutionary kind of sentiment or did that not get in the way? Oh, no, that was definitely, definitely um, a major issue. And in fact, one of the questions we have to ask historically is why did the great powers allow an independent Greece to come into existence when they didn't allow, um, they didn't allow the Spanish revolution to succeed, the Italian uprising, the Gavari to recede, the Decembrists in Russia, major uprising in Poland. The reason was this, after Napoleon, the great powers got together and created what's called the Concert of Europe. They would work together to maintain the status quo before the French Revolution. So they wanted to return Europe to the old age of monarchies. And so each of them demarcated spheres of influence. So France's spheres of influence was Spain. The Austrian Empire controlled Italy, Russia, Poland, right? So it's very clear. But who controls, who has a vested interest in Greece? Who is Greece's vested interest? They all claimed it. Britain claimed it because they needed, to, they needed the Mediterranean seaways. Austria claimed it because of the border with the Balkans. The French claimed it because, well, you know, they're, they like to say that Paris is the new Athens and all, they inherited the Greek civilization. Um, my point is that the great powers could not agree. And so they decided to cooperate then because none of them could have sway, none of them could incorporate Greece into their sphere of influence. So what they did is they acted together. And that's why up until 1913, France, Britain, and Russia were still Greece's guarantor party powers with the power to intervene in Greek affairs, which they did repeatedly. Excellent, no, thank you very much, thank right. you. And I, sorry to interrupt, could I say something more? I thought of a better, better answer about the question between Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. Right? Sure. Um, yeah, um, this is an age, an age of empire of um, aristocrats and competing dynasties and loyalties are personal and familial, right? So the situation I described uh, whereby uh, in the despotate of Ipirus, they asked in um, uh, Turkish soldiers um, who were allied with you know, this particular despot in, uh, uh, in uh, Ipirus. We have Christian soldiers fighting with Turkish soldiers in Anatolia. This is a very hard situation to imagine today, right? It was not a world of nation states. It was a, it was a world of pretenders to the throne and you have your allies from every, you know, sort of, uh, uh, so, you know, so, sort of supporters drawn from every sort of religion. So it's, it's a, just a completely different way of organizing international life. Oh, great. Thank you for the clarification. My next question, although I'm going to direct it to Dr. Constantino, um, but anyone else, can, if they have an answer for the question as well. But I'm interested and curious to know how it is that uh, eventually after the, the, the first hundred years settles, as uh, Dr. Gallant had covered, um, that we get to a point where there's a series of treaties and then Constantinople, which is, if I wasn't mistaken, it was part of Europe, was then somehow made the international city and given to, or under came under the jurisdiction of uh, modern day Turkey. Um, so Dr. Constantino, I don't know if you have an answer for that question or if not, uh, anybody else might take a stab at it. Hello. All of these uh, things supposedly were settled with the Treaty of Lausanne after the expulsion of the Greeks from Asia Minor in uh, 1920, after the failed Mikrasia Adhikara Sophie, 19, 1922. So all of these things supposedly were settled with the Treaty of Lausanne. Before that, what I personally, my personal reading of history, I find amazing actually, is how a, an empire that is falling apart with all of the atrocities that were committed and all of these outside interference in the, the dying Ottoman Empire and the rising uh, colonialism, you know, the French, the Italians, the British, all of these uh, things that happened, 
And, uh, you know, World War I, Turkey sides with the loser, with Germany. Then they managed to keep this thing going. But to me, it's, I mean, not uh, the way things should work. You know, the empire wasn't there. Uh, carved up and, uh, you know, divided up uh, like it happened in so many other places uh, at the end of the war. But that's my personal uh, thing. In uh, the present situation, however, we see this uh, aggressive uh, Turkey, as I mentioned, the larger country on the other end of the Aegean, but that they uh, throughout all of the Greek uh, populations, you know, uh, we have this uh, Togan uh, population in uh, Constantinople today with the Patriarchate and the few thousand maybe, you know, still there, but uh, there was a much uh, larger presence, you know, at the time of the, you know, the conclusion of the agreement and all of those types of things, including uh, Imbros and Denedos, you know, the Greek populations have been little by little expelled, uh, ethnic uh, cleansing like they did in uh, Cyprus more recently, the same uh, story, and uh, today, right now that we speak, Erdogan is more aggressive than ever, actually. A lot of things we see in the news about this uh, neo-Sultan, uh, you know, aspirations, you know, and the challenges to the Greek uh, sovereignty rights in all of these areas, all of these NAP taxes that they issue. Like last year, I have a whole this year, I didn't go into it you know, challenging uh, Greek sovereignty all over the Aegean, basically because uh, Turkey, as we know, didn't want to go to court to settle the issue of the territorial seas first, later on the exclusive economic zone. And uh, we have this uh, uh, projection of power all the way to Libya. You know, Erdogan is in Libya, disregarding, uh, you know, international law, you know, or interpreting it to his uh, uh, way. One uh, place, actually one way, another place, another way in the Black Sea. They applied the same uh, United Nations uh, law of the sea, divide up uh, the Black Sea with, uh, you know, the Soviets at the time and uh, Romania and Bulgaria. When it comes to the Aegean side, however, Greece cannot expand uh, and certainly not apply the exclusive economic zone now. Uh, because for Turkey, that is uh, Kazu's belly, you know, going back to the years of Konstantinos Karamanlis, senior Karamanlis, uh, in power, when they agreed first to go to, you know, the international court in the, at the Hague, and then later on, they said, we don't accept the result. So they changed their minds, and since then, it's challenge after challenge, including Cyprus, you saw them up, up there, how they claim all of this area all the way down, uh, you know, south of Cyprus, more or less. Even oh, with little uh, slice in the north. I mean, how do you expand that thing to go all the way down to the southern part of uh, Cyprus, you know, all of these uh, hydrocarbons? And that's a good point. It is very concerning today. No, thank you. Uh, yes, next uh, question I was going to direct to uh, I think, uh, Dr. Nuk. Oh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Vasily. You Mali wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say about uh, how Constantinople became um, Turkish, you know, there, there's a kind of a, a, a saying, but it's true, is that in the end, everybody rejected the Ottoman Empire, including the Turks, right? And so, so to understand how Constantinople became Turkish, you have to understand that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk broke with the Ottomans, right? Um, and rejected the Ottoman past. Uh, of all the peace treaties that were forced upon the defeated, uh, the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, and so on and so forth, the Ottomans after World War I, only one was torn up. Right, and that was the Treaty of Sev uh, imposed on the Ottomans. Uh, and it was torn up because of military resistance, successful military resistance by Kemal Ataturk. The Sultan was allied with the, with the British and the French in Istanbul. Uh, Ataturk managed to paint him, not surprisingly, as, as a national traitor. Um, and the British and the French, nobody expected um, uh, uh, this military resistance to come out. And the allies had just um, gone through World War I. Right? They gave away parts of, of the Ottoman Empire to, to the Greeks and to the Italians. They carved it up because they thought it would be easy. They never expected any Ottoman resistance because this had been going on for decades at that point. So there was a fundamental break between the Ottomans and, and the modern nation state of Turkey. And when the allies realized that they would have to fight in order to impose the Treaty of Sev, they weren't interested in doing that. 
So they signed the Treaty of Lausanne and went home. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Dr. Newton. Yes, sir. I know you're a philoleme. I know we're running out of time here. Uh, but tell us, from your perspective, uh, how the philolemes uh, help Greece uh, gain its independence. Um, I think that is, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. OK, great. Um, I think they helped a great deal. I actually think what um, I think that because of what Gre the Greeks underwent uh, and the wealthy and educated were able to get out and flee, many of them went to uh, Venice, for example. There's a large uh, Greek component of Venetian culture. Rigas Ferreos was there with his printing press. And so the, so the, the, the Greeks who were able to get out because they were educated and or had money left. What this did was I think it left who was left in Greece, the poor people, the villagers, the islanders. It left them, their soul was still, you know, they were as, as, much, as much in love with the idea of freedom as the intellectuals were. But they didn't have the education, they didn't have the learning. Um, and they, they became, I think, um, I'll use a, a term from uh, late, uh, late 1960s uh, psychology, a sort of inferior, inferior, inferiority complex. Um, that Greece was a peasant country, a poor country, all rocks. So when the, um, the Enlightenment hit and you have uh, uh, Korais, for example, in correspondence with Thomas Jefferson um, and uh, this opening up, up to the West, I think this actually emboldened the Greeks who were in Greece. And it's, it's ironic because on the one hand, we're, we're talking about, the, about Europe, Greece is where Europe begins. That dividing line right there is the coast of Asia Minor, right there. That borderline, the, where the Aegean, the Eastern Aegean, this is where the Persians came in to try to destroy the Greeks in the, in the, uh, uh, in the fifth century. Uh, and, the, and, the, and they were repelled there. That's always been the, the, where, the, where the cultural conflict kind of hits. So, what's it, what's, so Greece has sort of been in my estimate when I read things culturally, Greece has been both the birthplace of these Western ideals and also the, 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 the border guard of these ideals. I don't think that the Greeks themselves at that time, under the Ottomans especially, uh, were as keenly aware of that. They were just struggling to, to, to survive, to exist. They wanted to go to church. Um, they wanted to raise their kids as, as, as you know, most of us do in, uh, anyway. But it's kind of ironic in that all of these great ideas that were born in Greece, I mean, all the terminology is Greek. I mean, all these words we're using were referring about democracy and patriarchate and uh, um, constitutional uh, monarchies and all this. All certain, these are all Greek born ideas. They went to the West, got developed, and then they came back. And what that did was, I think it, it emboldened the, the, the Greeks who were sort of left behind and they said, wow, we must be something because we, these ideas are coming back to us and, and, and we, we know them. So um, uh, that, was a direct, that was a major impact. Yes, for yeah. sure. Oh, so, 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 so when the Phil Hellenes come in and they say, wow, they're not even Greek and they're, and they're here fighting for our cause. When Lord Byron came in to fight in Mesolonghi, he died in Mesolonghi. I mean, he died. Uh, Lord Byron, I don't, I don't know if people know this, but uh, Lord Byron is um, um, at the Beautiful. Cemetery of the Heroes in Mestolonghi, which, which Stavro showed a picture of. Um, Lord Byron's tomb is there, but he actually, he, he wrote this um, poem, Maid of Athens, ere we part, give, oh, give me back my heart. And Lord Byron's heart is actually buried in Mesolonghi. It was cut, he had it cut out to be, be buried in Mesolonghi, and then his body was buried in, in um, I think, uh, Westminster Abbey, I think. But but that these non-Greeks would so much love the Greeks, I think that really gave them encouragement. It, it, it sort of validated them, I'll use that term. Whereas in fact, the irony I think is the Greeks validated the West, <laughs> but they had to look to the West to be revalidated. Okay. I can't- oh, It worked both ways, thank you for that. Yeah, okay. We're running, we're running close on time, you have a couple minutes left. Uh, but my last question is to Dr. Zacharias who can probably confirm what you just said about uh, Lord Byron's heart being uh, buried in yeah. Mesologi. Is that is true, Dr. Zagarias? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the city and the, the big thing, big issue. In uh, five years from now, they will celebrate 200 years from uh, 
this uh, exodus from in Mesologi in uh, eight, from 1826, where Lord Byron is a major figure there, and there's a, a society for uh, studying uh, Byron's uh, uh, biography and work. Excellent. The one question I have for you, and we have a couple of minutes, and that is over the, the hard work that you and your staff uh, have been working on the Roads of Freedom project since 2018 to present today, have you seen yourself the benefit that that project has conferred to the community? Yes, we see already benefits. I think we think a lot already, though it was the pandemic. Uh, we still are in this pandemic, this coronavirus situation, but uh, the celebrations will go on uh, next year also, and the coming years, like what happened a uh, hundred years ago. And um, I see there will be uh, measurable uh, benefits from this uh, 1821 history of modern Greece in the country. And I think this year, the her heritage and education is, uh, can guarantee prosperity in the area. And education, we all know that uh, uh, Greek families, they invest a lot to educate their children. So if uh, this traditional, let's say, <clears throat> spirit keeps on, goes on, and on the other hand, if there is stability in the area, because as uh, <clears throat> Dr. Newton said, Aegean is the barrier between East and West, and it is a very sensitive uh, point on the earth. So stability and education can guarantee growth and prosperity, I think. Excellent, no, thank you very much. And that uh, brings our program to conclusion. I want to thank the speakers for their wonderful and terrific, terrific and informative presentations. Thank the Greek school and Goyens for their contributions as well. I also like to thank Father Jerry and Father Nick uh, for making this possible. Without their efforts, this would not have happened. And um, we, um, we're grateful for the opportunity to, to be able to stand here and honor those that uh, fought for the basic principles that are so important to us today and continue to be and will be in the future because it's uh, certainly well understood in your circles that, um, in all our circles, that knowing our history is very important to planning for the future. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω όλους εσάς που παρακολουθήσατε και όλους εσάς που συμμετείχατε σε αυτό το webinar. Η βοήθεια όλων σας ήταν σημαντική και έτσι βλέπουμε ότι το ενδιαφέρον για το μεγάλο αυτό γεγονός δεν περιορίζεται σε χρόνο είτε σε χώρο. Νιώθουμε περήφανοι για την πατρίδα μας, ζήτω ο ελληνισμός, ζήτω το έθνος μας. Voila. 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 At, this, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Father uh, Jerry to for his concluding remarks and uh, closing prayer. Thank you, Tony. And I, you thanked all of the, the speakers and everyone today. And they did an amazing job of offering so many different uh, facets of, of things for us to consider um, as we you know, celebrate this milestone. Thank you, Tony and Linda for doing an amazing job of putting this program together. So we thank you for all of the work that, that you have done and um, for the, you know, providing us with this opportunity to, um, to commemorate this event in such a, a beautiful and uh, dignified way today. So thank you all for being here. And let me uh, close by just offering the, uh, the uh, English translation of Tiper Macho, as we uh, as we close and remember the the um, the, the uh, triumph of this day, O Champion General, I your city now inscribe to you triumphant anthems as the tokens of my gratitude, being rescued from the terrors, O Theotokos, inasmuch as you have power unassailable from all kinds of perils, free me so that unto you I may cry aloud, rejoice, O unwedded bride. Thank you all. God bless you. God give you uh, strength as we continue on this Lenten journey. Zito Elas. Zito Elas. Thank you, Father. <laughs>